also he is um, well loved because of the inland folk music that he has been doing for many, many years. Uh, I, for one, am a groupie. I listen to it every Saturday at 9 o'clock. And uh, so we're delighted that Dan Marr is here um, to discuss and to share with us words about moving onward with your disability, from denial to dealing with, and going onward from there. So please join me in welcoming Dan Moore. Let me just read these notes for a second. <laughs> Today our theme is about disability in the wild. Oh, cool. Okay. I got it. I got an award one time from Spokane Public Radio, and it was a. They 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 had it done in Braille. It was a plaque for uh, the volunteer service for doing the radio show, which in Spokane is not paid for. Here it is, but uh, they gave me this award, and <laughs> and it, it was a it was a kind of a, a stiff crowd, and and. Um, in this, in the Bing Crosby Theater, and the the award was in Braille, and it said, you know, for Dan Marr for volunteer services for the community of Spokane, da 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 da. And I was reading it, and the manager was giving the award, and I was just reading it, and I was kind of amazed, because I don't get a lot of Braille. There isn't a lot of Braille flying around anymore, hardly, you know. And to get to get a Braille award to me was really something. But he's he's talking, and then there was this big space because he was done talking. And I was still reading the award. And so I thought, I better do something about this. And so I went, call me Ishmael. <laughs> and the audience was like, what? <laughs> so, um, in the media, when I was young, oh, you know, probably 10, 15 years ago, um, I, 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 in, in elementary school and middle school, we were... We were still part of the tail end of this um, development of radio and television. And television was just getting started, pretty much. It had been around for maybe 10 years, a little bit earlier than that. And, uh, and, and radio was not really on its way out. It was still the kind of controlling medium. And all of us especially male blind men were into radio and we all wanted to be radio DJs and we all wanted and of course it was a very male industry I think it kind of still is um, and and so but we wanted to be the ones who would say hey and that was Ricky Nelson and he would you see and we wanted to be the ones who would say so buy Volkswagen and when we were eight or nine or ten years old we would be going so buy Volkswagen um, and we and we loved it. And every time a new gadget came out, every time an, the whole computer industry was developing as well, and robots and all these things, and it was all Fireball XL5 and Buck Rogers and and Flash Gordon still, and all these sci-fi's and these these sci-fi's that had uh, you know these mutants from nuclear days, and people would fly to Mars and everything, and this voice would go. We are going to destroy you, you know, that kind of thing. And we loved it. We loved it because it was a voice, because it was audio, because it was, it was sound, and we loved it. We also read books. We read a lot of talking books. People still do. That, that is still going on from the Library of Congress. Read lots and lots and lots of books. I have, I'm ambivalent about that now um, in that uh, there was a lot more Braille available in those days. Braille is so bulky and so expensive and so heavy. And even the Braille displays, the new modern Braille displays are, are, are again, very price prohibitive. And, uh, but uh, I used to read all the time. I remember going, I remember going to bed at 9 o'clock at night after Bonanza. 
And, and of course, you older people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a wonderful world of color and then a comedy and then Bonanza. And it was part of America's Sunday night routine. I remember going to bed and picking up a book and reading it and reading it and reading it and getting so into it. And it was Braille. It was me and the book. It was nothing else. It was me and the book. It was me and that author. And that author was giving me their words. And it was, and I could imagine what those characters were like. And my imagination was going nuts. And then all of a sudden, my mom would be calling me and saying, it's time to get up and go to school. And I will have read all night long. And I would do that two, three nights in a row. And by the time Thursday rolled around, I was, exa- I was just an exhausted little kid sleeping in the front row. So it's really important that you get where I'm coming from. Now, where I'm coming from is only where I'm coming from. And that makes it legit. But, you know, you start to talk about disabilities, media or otherwise, and you start to talk about this, and you, you begin to get into this. And it, it's cool that I've been asked to do this because I've started, I, I've really actually thought more about my quote-unquote disability than I have ever thought about it in my entire life. Because I had a lot of support in school. Because when it came time to do Washington State University and learn my way around Washington State University, I isolated. I took my own time, but I did it finally. Nobody helped me fight those battles. It was me and my disability. I isolated. And in those days, you know, we used to, we wouldn't even get our books until halfway through the semester on tape. There's this thing called tape. It's on reel to reels, isn't it? And that, and that's what I did. I was never good at taking my disability, articulating it with other folks with disabilities, so that we would all understand each other. And I can remember, you know, people saying, oh yeah, I saw Longstreet. Do you remember Longstreet? Longstreet was the blind detective with the seeing eye dog named Pax. And, oh yeah, I saw the miracle worker. I remember we had to, when I was a kid, we had to all go see the miracle worker because Helen Keller was the role model. And Helen Keller now, I read her socialist stuff. I really admire her thinking. But in those days, I was a young male. It was like, why do I want a female role model? I couldn't get it in the 60s. It's like, I need a male role model. And there wasn't one. But we had to see the, the elementary school. They took us to see six or seven different productions of The Miracle Worker. Now I really admire that whole thing. And those people at the Perkins School for the Blind. Anyway, so the point is, I've never thought about it until just really this last symposium that I did last year. I began to think about how does my disability and all these things that I've supposedly done or not done, and the not done is just as crucial as the done, how, how, does, how do I relate this? And, and the more I think about it, the more complex it gets. Because I also come from a background, and when I got into student involvement, it wasn't going to be my career of choice. So I learned by, I learned by earning. I learned as I went along about marginalization and quote-unquote minorities and, and all of this kind of thing and racial this and racial that. And somewhere in there, I learned that there are other minorities as well. And so all of a sudden, I'm, I'm thinking about this now, and I'm going, so where am I in this big picture? And where should I be in this big picture? Or should I be anywhere in this big picture? And these are the kinds of things that are becoming very, very troubling to me. Not because I have or haven't done anything to further the thought process about disabilities. I used to say, well, as long as I'm me and as long as I set a good example and as long as, I, as, as long as I'm cool to other people and do what I'm so that should be enough. Maybe so. Maybe so. And when people say, Dan, I just sort of forget that sometimes that you're blind. Is that good enough? Maybe so. There are those who would say, no, that's only a start. 
And why do they forget that you're blind? They're more comfortable because you're doing these normal things. And then all of a sudden when you say to them, yeah, but I'm going to have a problem doing this, you throw them a real curve. Where does the disability begin? Where does it end? Where is it? In 1998, I remember I was dating this woman. And I remember it was 98 um, just because of what happened subsequently. But in 19, and she said, you know, Dan, I, I really can't continue this relationship because you know what? You're, you're, this disability thing, it just keeps cropping up all the time. And you're so much more than that. And it's all so much more than that. But you don't, but you, you don't really deal with the fact that there are other things going on. This disability thing is always there. I've got to read you menus. I've got to do this. When we're in areas where you've never been, I've got to help you get around. I've got to, I'm just tired of it. I just can't do it anymore. It's been fun. See ya. I was like, okay. <laughs> so in 1998, about four months later, I was involved in another relationship. She says, Dan, you know what the, you know what the real problem is, is you don't deal with your disability enough. The problem is is that like it is so much a, a larger component and an influence on, on who and what you are, and you're sort of ignoring it. And, and the real issue with me is, is like, it's like it's prominent, and you need to work with it more. You need to understand. So, uh, so I can't deal with this anymore. See ya. It's like, wow, there's no pleasing you people with vision. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, what's going on here? And then I began to figure it out. And here's what I figured out. And this is why I don't do the PowerPoint or anything like that, because I don't understand it. I should do it. I'm always afraid. When I was a kid in college, I had about, oh, you know, 150 pieces of vinyl. And I left for a retreat, and I came back, and they'd taken all my vinyl, and they'd taken out, out of all the jackets and put the, the, the records in the different jackets. And so I had them all in order and everything. And, and so I'd go to listen to my Led Zeppelin, and it would be John Denver. Um, so I, I kind of so so I always figure if I'm doing PowerPoint, somebody's going to play a trick on me, and I'll wind up, you know, showing pictures of like, you know, f forest land or something, and not the words that I want. So it's basically I don't trust folks. Um, <laughs> but the other part of it is 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 you're in my world now, and you need to listen. And there are a few key points that I want you to that I want you to think about, and even write down if you wish, especially if you're a person with a disability, whatever that means. And this is one of them. One of them is this. Your disability, and I think Meredith alluded to this, your disability is an inconvenience. But for the most part, in your life, you have a lot more control over it than you think you do. You should never, ever, ever let your disability control your life. I remember I was listening to a, one of the veterans at Veterans Day back in, uh, in, oh, I don't know, 2006, 2007, and he was talking about his PTSD. And it was a horrific story, and he was very frank, and he was very blunt. And then he said, okay, all of you out there with PTSD, don't you ever, ever let your PTSD control you. You figure out ways to control it, and you can do that. And that's the thing about your disability. You control. And there are all these externals. There's this media thing going on she was talking about. There are all kinds of stereotypes. There are all kinds of discomforts. There are all kinds of things going on, and they're all so varied. You know, from, you know, every day I have to put up with people that to one degree or another may be uncomfortable with the fact that I don't have eye contact. Maybe they finally get used to listening, to listening to me. Maybe they don't. But the point is, is initially they do. And I have to be very aware of that. But it's my awareness. Do you see what I'm driving at? I'm the one that says, yes, we're going to deal with this disability, but we're going to do it on my terms. And it's key that we do that. It is so key that we do that. Where is this disability component in all these other arenas that we have, all these other resources, all these other potentials? Where is it? What is it and what does it do? So am I 
a fairly decent singer and a crappy guitar player because I'm visually impaired? And uh, am I a well-known radio personality in the Northwest because I'm visually impaired? Am I respected in student involvement as a resource and as somebody who knows what's going on because I'm visually impaired? No. Mm -mm. But that visual impairment has been a factor in how I've done and dealt with all that stuff. And it's all about where I place it, not where anybody else does. You know, I'm, I did that symposium, did this symposium last year, and I went back and watched it. It was very emotional. I had just been involved in a hit and run a couple weeks before. And it's very anecdotal and it's very peppy. And I thought to myself, you know, with this theme and everything like that, what I want to do is kind of dig a little bit deeper. So what I'm telling you is never, ever, ever let that disability control who and what you are. And be very aware of where that component is amongst all of your other talents, skills, and potentials. It is such a big deal. And then you say, oh, but I'm a person with a disability. How do I go and explore all this other stuff? You take the risk. And you should never, ever, ever be afraid of making a mistake. I had a student, an international student one time that used to say, yep, yeah, you know, mistakes are okay. If it happens a second time, though, that means it's a pattern. That means you've got problems. But you're going to take risks. Whether you're able-bodied or, or a person with a disability, you are going to take risks and you are going to be wrong. And at that point, you go, okay, I was wrong. I'm going to be rebound. I'm going to rebound. If this idea is still a cool idea, I'm going to work harder at making sure that I'm going to be right the next time. But you do not know everything. And it, it applies to your inner self as well. You do not know everything. I was talking to a colleague this morning, and we were talking about all of this stuff. And I was thinking of the universalities of marginalization. The idea that marginalized individuals, whether they be people of color, whether they be women, LGBTQ, whether they be persons with disabilities, the point is, is we're all marginalized and there are certain universalities, most of those universalities dealing with the fact that there's a lack of understanding. And there are those people out there who would be very, un who be very comfortable not understanding. Because once they understand, that means they got to deal with it. Well, we are the same way. If we don't understand our own marginalization and where, where our placement is with all that, then, then we're going to have problems. Once you get past the denial stage and say, I am marginalized, but I am no more or less a person than anybody else, it's cool. Because then you'll work. And I'm not like a higher ed type. You know, I don't, I don't understand all the, the lingo and the programs. I've never approached my disability along those lines. But I do know that in order to help others, and ultimately that's what we as marginalized individuals have to do. We have to help others. Because when it comes to budget cuts and lack of understanding and all these different things, where does it all go? It goes to marginalized. When the budget gets cut in an institution, when the budget gets cut in the federal government, where does it go? So ultimately, marginalized people, whether they be persons with disabilities, which really know no boundaries. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of veterans out there that are disabled, a lot of women, a lot of men, a lot of multicultural people with color, all kinds of folks out there that have disabilities. And in order to make all of that work, we have to get together, we have to unite. And I don't envision that it's going to get much better. Thank God for universities. Thank God for, for scientists that are exploring some of this stuff. But politically, I don't know. And then, and then we have a few people that are stars. I got a note the other day, an email that said, when you do your TV program, I do a TV program. Did you know that? She didn't mention my TV program. 
I do a TV program called Jam with Dan. And when I, when I listen to the thing on, online, it just shows me how little I know musically. <laughs> All these different performers come in and I'm supposed to play tunes with them and I'm like, whoa, you know? <laughs> Is because they're all much better than I am. But somebody said, why don't you use a Braille watch and look at the time, you know what I mean, so that people can see, you know, more that you, you use these tools. And my first thought was, why? I like my Apple watch. Then I thought about it a little bit more, and I went, you know, one, I don't like my Apple Watch as much as I like to think I do. And two, why not look at a Braille watch? It doesn't talk right in the middle of somebody's dialogue. It's just a Braille watch. Why not have my Braille watch at meetings so that when the meeting gets a little bit boring, the Apple Watch will say, it's 410. And Braille watch, nobody even knows. I used to love Braille. When I was a kid, I used to, and I know this is kind of rambly, but this is a great story. When I was a kid, remember back in the old days when you used to do the, the, the preamble to the Constitution? And it said, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and whatever. I couldn't remember which came first, and we were supposed to recite it. Which comes first, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. So I brailled the whole thing on a sheet of braille paper, walked up, I was a little third grader, I just stuck it in my pocket and walked up and read the whole thing. <laughs> I got an A. I used to, I used to, they used to braille the tests, and braille is so much bigger and bulkier, but most of the teachers didn't know. Did I go too long? What? Oh, I did? I did that? Wow, it's a little piano action. Thanks, George. Ooh. I'm sorry about that. That was really cool. I mean, couldn't it have been some folky stuff just to plug the show? Um, Anyway, the, the point is, is that so I used, to take, I used to take my notes on the same kinds of pages that those tests were done on, and I used to insert my notes in the test pages, and I used to take my tests and read my notes at the same time. The Braille thing was really cool. But back to my point, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of wind up with this. These are the cardinal rules. The first rule is don't let your disability control you. You control it. Now, you may... And, and you control what people think, and you do what you do. And you may lapse. We were talking about the fight this morning, and we have to keep fighting every day. And no, you do not. You can't be expected to do that. There are times when you're just going to, you know, there are just times when you can't. And that's okay. Because the next day you can. As long as you understand that you have that control. And how, how that's going to work. That is your control. The second thing that's really important is never, ever, ever use your disability, whether it be invisible or otherwise or whatever, as an excuse. You can use it as a reason, but not as an excuse. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference. Because if it's an excuse, an excuse implies you got some other things going on, that you're a procrastinator, that you're lazy, that you're tired, that you're whatever, that you're scared. And those are better, re the scared thing is a good reason. Don't kid yourself, those of us who are persons with disabilities, and I don't care what daredevil does, I always thought that was just the stupidest thing. I, um, the, uh, we're afraid. When I was 16, 17, I was being rehabilitated by the, by the, the state. I don't remember being habilitated, but I was being rehabilitated. And we had to take cane travel. And I had never used a cane before. I'm a firm believer in the cane. I think before you get dogs, I think you should always use the cane for a couple of years because the cane shows you 
a lot more detail and it shows you rules of the road and all kinds of stuff. The, with the cane, you have to be much, 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 much more alert. And they made us cross an intersection. They said, we're going we're gonna to show you what, quote unquote, blind deaf people have to go through. So they put headphones on us, took us to a busy intersection, and we had to cross with our cane. And all you could hear through those headphones was the low frequency of big trucks, but you couldn't tell where it was coming from. And they said, cross this street. And I was scared to death. I was really scared. And it took about 25 seconds to cross that street. Seemed like years. And I got across. When I was getting my first dog, they took us to a five-way intersection, had a little street coming in at an angle with no lights. Trust your dog, they said. Cross this street. I was scared, and I got across. So what I'm telling you is this. Fear is a big factor, and it is a reason. It is not an excuse. But never, ever, ever use your disabilities as an excuse. There are times I've worked for student involvement now for 38, almost 39 years, and there are times when there were bosses who should have said to me, hey, Dan, that's bull. That's crap. And they should have said it that way because you know what? If they had said that, I would have went, oh, I would have gone. Sorry, I'm an English major. I would have gone, oh, they're right. Somebody need to kick me in the butt and say, Dan, that is just crap. I used to use technology as a huge excuse to not have to, not have to face the fears that I had about technology, the kind of fears that old people have. And finally somebody said, well, Dan, you know, we're going to have, we're gonna have the, adv the advisors start to do, Evelyn Martinez said this, we're going to have the advisors, you know, review the events forms now, and there's going to take a, you know, you're going to take a lot more initiative in doing this review thing. So all of a sudden, I had to learn my screen reader more than I had chosen to. And we got through it, and I still don't quite know how to do it, but it's there. It can be done. So excuses are nuts. Reasons are cool, but you've got to know which is which. And most of this stuff is, is, is surmountable, most of it. That which is not surmountable, okay, so let's work on it. Let's figure out a way that we can at least reach a compromise. And finally, before I end, and I know that I, I really appreciate your patience because, you know, this, 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 this old guy that never dresses up, uh, it's like this is a lot to take in, and attention spans are interesting because they are so visual. I battle with visual every day. But I think ultimately, and I've alluded to this before, I think ultimately, those of us who are marginalized, I think it is so easy. I told this to the veterans four or five years back. I said, you know, you're isolating yourselves too much. You're isolating yourselves from other veterans. You need to do a conference. You need to do a regional conference. We need to get some folks out here. And they did. It was, it was, it was a obviously a first, a first endeavor, it had a lot of problems. But I'll never forget it when, when I walked into the room, it was at the, the, the room was at the Holiday Inn. And I walked in there and there was some state official talking about something. And all of a sudden, all these young veterans started asking questions and started interacting in a formal sense, but they were excited and they were enthused. And I'll never forget way deep down the feeling inside me that said, this had to happen. And I've been advising the Student Veterans Committee since 1984, and this was 2014, 15. And it was like, why did this wait so long to happen? And we have to start thinking that way. 
Isolationism is such a danger. Yeah, we got we to gotta figure out some things and internalize, and we've got to do some awareness things first before we can start helping everybody else. But ultimately, our goal is to make things better, and the only way we can do that is to work with and help everybody else. Unity is such a big thing marginalized unity, and I'm not talking about various types of marginalizations individually. I'm talking about all marginalized folks need to get together and create unity because that's the way understanding is going to happen. And within the marginalized communities, we have to start understanding each other. And don't kid yourself, there's friction within the various communities as well. Everybody has a different way that it's all supposed to happen. And again, with all these environmental variables and everything, everybody says, well, if we did it this way, my way, that's, that's what the Tea Party did. Let's do it my way. No, we have to do it the best way. And unity is where it's all at. So... I appreciate this, and you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to relate this to the media thing. I, I enjoy being on TV because um, you know, you're supposed to look at the camera, and, and it's like the camera looks at me instead. I, I don't even think about the camera. Um, and, and at the same time, when I'm in radio, when I'm doing the radio thing, I think a lot more about, about how people visualize who and what I do. So it's real interesting. In TV, I don't even worry about the visual. In radio, I worry about it. I don't worry about it. I think about it a lot. I am so lucky. I am so lucky that I had a lot of things that I had. I am not unlucky because I didn't have some of the things that, that, that are available nowadays. Time just does that. You can't fault time. You can't say... My doctor didn't know about retrolental fibroplasia, so he gave me too much oxygen, and that's why I'm blind, and so therefore I'm going to sue him. They didn't know. And ultimately, you can't use the past as a tool to take out your baggage. I am so lucky that all of you would even want me to do this today. I am so lucky that I have students that say, thanks, Dan. I am so lucky that I have a, a radio and TV public that say, that was a good song. And I am so lucky that I have way deep down within my soul and my spirit that urge that says, I can still learn, I can still grow, and I can still make it better. Thank you very much. So uh, I didn't check the time. Where am I at time-wise? Does anybody, just real quick, how about we do a, and, and you know, it's okay if you don't, if you want to ask questions. You know, when I do this thing for high schools and stuff, there's always somebody who goes, well, man, were you at Woodstock? Um, no. I saw the movie with everybody else and went, wow. Yeah. So are there any questions at all? And I'm not, uh, my ego isn't in it if there aren't. No questions? That was that complete, huh? Damn, okay, I'm cool. Alrighty, thanks so very much again. Thank you, Dan. That was wonderful. I always love to hear Dan speak because it's so genuine, so heartfelt, so positive. Gives me lots of joy, 
So again, thank you, Dan. Um, I'd like to, it's my pleasure to introduce our next uh, speakers. No? Not quite yet. So um, why don't you enjoy some more coffee, some more pastries, and we likely will be starting in five minutes or so.
It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speakers, uh, Acacia Capusta, and she is with CEIE as an Outreach and Awareness Coordinator, doing great work, and um, Amber Graham, who is a Hall Director in Straight Parham, and they are going to be talking about at the intersection of disability and LGBTQ plus identity. Um, and so it really gives us great uh, pleasure to welcome them here today. Um, so thanks. Thanks, Acacia and Amber. <laughs> well, good morning, all. I uh, hope you all are doing well this morning. We are so excited to have you all in this group. Um, so if you are able, if you don't mind scooting forward, we'd love to have you all um, present in this space while we get our uh, presentation up and going here. Um, 
All right, so thank you so much. So again, my name is Amber Graham. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a residential education director over in Straight Parham Hall. Um, this is my second year at WSU. Um, and today I am wearing a black blazer, white shirt, um, dark pants, and pink shoes. Hi everyone, my name is Acacia Capusta. Um, I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Student Affairs Unit called Community Equity and Inclusive Excellence. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns, um, and I am in a, um, an eye-level wheelchair wearing a blue and gray top, uh, jeans, and black boots. Um, so we're gonna get started uh, by talking about our learning objectives. Yeah, so we have a couple different learning objectives for folks today. So by the end of the session, we're really hoping that folks gain a further understanding of uh, LGBTQ identities, uh, the history of uh, the LGBTQ community, and the disability rights uh, community within higher education. We're specifically focused on this within colleges and universities. Um, while there is an expansive history outside of higher education, we specifically want to be thinking about the student experience and how are we helping students here within WCO. We also want to understand current issues um, as they affect the intersection of these identities. So certainly people are complex and they have multiple different identities. And so we want to make sure that we are thinking about how can we understand current issues and how can we be advocating for our students as well. We also want to talk about language because that's a super important component too. Uh, language and learning is ongoing and so we want to make sure that as uh, language continues to ebb and flow that we are also staying up to date with um, current language, outdated language, and things like that, especially those that are salient to the LGBTQ community and the disability rights community. We also want to recognize lived experiences of LGBTQ students who have physical, mental, learning, or sensory disabilities. And we'll unpack what all that means here shortly, um, but we want to recognize those lived experiences and what that looks like. And finally, we want to understand prior prior and current theories uh, regarding um, the disability community and how are folks within the disability community viewed? Um, how are those conversations ha uh, been had in the past and how has that impacted the history of um, students who have disabilities within higher education and their access to different means and resources in their experience? So um, to go over quickly what we're going to be discussing in this 50-ish uh, minutes, or a little bit less, um, uh, we're gonna start with foundation, so kind of getting um, a better understanding of what the two identities mean, um, and then why that matters. Um, and then talking about intersectionality, what does that mean, um, and then how does that relate to language and terminology? Um, like Amber said, the history behind language terminology and both of these communities, um, the human human rights, uh, civil rights type um, history. Uh, just a really quick overview. We're not gonna test you at the end, don't worry. I know I hate history, so I don't know about you. Um, and then um, we're going to talk a little bit about some current trends, things that are happening in either communities right now. Um, and then, um, like Amber said, the theory and models of thinking specifically about the disability community, because those are important in terms of understanding um, how how the disability can be viewed in multiple different ways and how that may be impacted um, by individual di dis disabilities. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about healthcare issues and then talk about some action items. So kind of wrapping that up, figuring out what does that mean for us and how we can move forward and what we can do um, to support both of these communities, especially those at the intersections of these communities. Awesome, so a couple different foundations. Um, there's only one intersection um, in a complex, or this is only one intersection in a complex conversation around identity. We'll talk a little bit about what intersectionality means and how that um, plays out within identity as well. Um, but we wanna see how this applies specifically within student development, how students are growing within their experience here, um, WSU and other institutions. Um, this is also not intended to only be the one-time conversation, right? So we need to continue learning about these different things, learning how we can better support students. And there's all sorts of different literature and research. Um, we've synthesized size, some information that we've been able to find, um, but there's always more to be learning and the conversation is always endless. So we encourage you to continue to learn outside of the space as well. This is also an open and safe space. So as you have questions, as you have things that you're concerned about or um, things that you're maybe a little um, hesitant in terms of understanding terminology or history like that, this is a sp safe space where you can feel free to um, ask questions, gain a better understanding, and really um, help your own learning sort of thing. The other side of that too is that um, we also wanna practice calling in, not calling out. So we wanna bring people back in if they make mistakes or um, if there's something that they don't quite understand. We wanna practice that sense of calling in because we want folks to feel comfortable and be in a sense of community. Um, and again, as we make mistakes, it's 
part of learning, but also understanding that this is a space where we want to call folks in. Um, we encourage you, again, to ask all questions. Uh, we really want to focus on this being um, a learning space. And again, focusing on, again, this is not the one time that we're going to be having this conversation, that we're going to be continuing to have this conversation outside of this space and continuing your learning. But hopefully, this sparks your interest in this topic as well. Um, the other side of this, too, is that we will try to leave some time at the very end for any questions that you might have. Um, with all that being said, um, reflect on maybe some things that you want to learn. And if you have any questions, we can certainly be available. Um, our contact information also should be available on the last slide as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, but without further ado, we're going to turn it over to start our contact, or uh, content, rather. OK, so um, why, does, why does or should this matter to to me, to you, to all of us. Um, so uh, for those of us that are faculty and staff or work with students in leadership roles or anything like that, um, it's important that we are developing our students holistically. So rather than, um, so you know, some of us that are in the room today work at the Access Center or some maybe work at GSORC or at UREC. Um, so you, instead of working with these individuals within that one identity where you know them from, um, understanding them holistically as a whole student and, um, um, understanding the different identities and how they're impacted um, maybe more or less or differently um, based on those specific identities um, as we're talking about today in the LGBTQ identities or, and um, disabilities. Um, so uh, external factors um, that are affecting students' performance in the classroom. So those of you that are faculty, um, understanding uh, that there may be things happening um, not within the classroom that may be affecting your students in their day-to-day -day lives. Those of you that work in the res halls or in student affairs, um, understanding that there are things that may be impacting them in other areas that you're not seeing necessarily. Um, and then what you can do to support them better and make their experiences here at WSU better, because that's ultimately what we're, what we're here for and what we're doing. Um, our jobs at WSU, no matter where you work or what you do, is to, uh, to better the student experience. Um, and then knowledge, understanding, empathy, and care. So uh, first, you need to know in order to understand, um, in order to, uh, you need to understand in order to empathize and in order to care for your students. Um, and then the ability to take action as an ally and know your resources in the process. Um, so in order to be an effective ally, you need to understand, know, and care about your students and, um, and what is impacting them or how. Awesome. So we're going to first start talking about intersectionality because that's a really important component in terms of understanding this lived experience and these identities. So intersectionality is an idea first brought forward by Kimberly Crenshaw. Her study was uh, specifically focused on women of color and how they navigated the criminal justice system. Um, Crenshaw came to the conclusion that intersectionality is a lens through which we can see where power collides and where it interlocks and intersects. Um, a lot of this is looking at from a systemic level or looking at it from um, a society level. So in terms of women of color who went through the criminal justice process, maybe did not have the same access to um, lawyers or the same experience in terms of interacting with police, interacting with um, those within the criminal justice system um, compared to their white um, female peers or women or female identifying peers. Um, and so understanding that um, intersectionality also impacted not only based on race, but also on gender. And so that's where intersectionality is the whole idea of where we're breaking this down in terms of multiple different identities impacting a person's lived experience. The other way that we can look at um, intersectionality is through the model of multiple dimensions of identity. Um, some of you who maybe did some graduate research study on identity development may recognize this. Um, so in looking at this, there's a couple different things. So in the center, there's like a um, neutron or neuron. I'm not really much for science. But um, there's a, an object that has a couple different rings. And then there is a, a darker circle in the center. On the different rings surrounding the dark circle um, are different dots placed on those different rings. So the center dot represents who you are as a person. It represents your values, uh, maybe the way that you were raised, um, the things that are really important to you, your morals, things like that. Those rings around it and the dots then are your social identities. So some dots that are closer to the center might be a more salient identity. So for me, being a part of the LGBTQ community is something that's very salient for me. Um, but then faith um, is something that's not really salient for me. So that's something that might be like on my outer ring if you're looking at my social identity. Um, and so if you're unpacking social identity, this is one way to look at this. The waffle-shaped item to the left of that then is actually your meaning-making filter. This is how you understand the world or this is how, how you're interpreting your world, your interactions, conversations with folks. 
types, and then the arrows that are going through the waffle type item towards the neutron item, um, those are your contextual influences. So that's conversation with your family, with your peers, um, and understanding that maybe how conversations are impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. So whether that's a microaggression, if it's a, um, or if it's just a conversation that you're having to somebody, how is that impacting you on your day-to-day -day basis? And how, as a passive through your meaning-making filter, does it impact you on a day-to-day -day basis? So understanding that this is another way to look at identity and how students or people are impacted on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's also important to note that the little beads on those rings, um, they're, they're designed like a solar system because those, um, those little beads can shift um, towards or away from the center. Um, so depending on your environment or your situation, conversations, life experiences, um, the salience of each of those identities can change. Um, so uh, establishing a common language. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, different uh, language and definitions um, and what those mean to us in this context. Um, so we use the word disabled um, and to mean ways in which people are restricted from activities in their environments. Um, so yeah. We'll just put it, leave it at that for now. Um, and then uh, neuro, neurodiverse um, just means that um, you have a neurological functioning that differs from the dominant assumptions. So whether that is autism, dyslexia, a TBI, um, effects of medication can cause these things. Um, functional limitations are um, the ways in which people are limited or restricted from activities by impairment or environment. Um, and then ableism is a systemic and social discrimination towards disabled people and the attitudes that um, value the attitude that values or devalues certain ideals or attributes. Um, so, for example, um, walking versus uh, people who use walking. Walking people are better than people who use wheelchairs. Um, that's just one uh, one of the assumptions that we make. Not or better or are the norm or that kind of um, concept. So we also want to focus on outdated terminology. So things that you may have heard is handicapped. Um, we certainly don't want to be using language like that. Um, there's a really negative historical connotation, and there's just negative origins in terms of how that term has been used and um, how people view um, handicapped folks. Um, and so ultimately, it's a term that we really should be um, refraining from using. Um, I, I know a lot of folks who will refer to accessibility buttons as like a handicap button, but again, we can refer to that as an accessibility button and understanding how can we um, change our language and our day-to-day -day interactions or again, call folks in in terms of understanding where we need to remove oppressive language on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we also need to be cognizant of ways in which um, language is also impacting people in terms of their views of folks from the disability community. Um, also, um, people with disabilities, or PWDs, um, shortened version of that. Um, so in terms of looking at folks as lesser than, viewing them as um, folks who suffer from, or afflicted with, or bound by, those are terms that really view people from a medical model, which um, we will unpack here shortly. But it's the whole idea that you're looking at somebody as lesser than um, somebody who is able-bodied, and so certainly that's problematic, and so um, unpacking that language as well. Um, we also want to be addressing language that maybe is idealizing somebody with positive traits to an impairment, like they're so brave or they're so courageous, it's like they're also just a human being, and we need to just acknowledge them for who they are, because that's a really important component too. Um, and so we don't want to be reinforcing um, they're so brave because they, they live with this um, disability. Um, and so certainly I'm um, acknowledging that while um, it is important to celebrate people, we should not just be putting that based around somebody's social identity as well. Um, and then also language that um, euphemizes um, disability. So differently able, um, disability, special needs, handicapable, things like that. So um, ultimately we need to be um, cognizant of this language and understanding if we hear that, maybe unpacking that in a moment and understanding why that is problematic as well. Um, so different language and usages um, that we will be talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll let Amber do this first part. Yeah, so introductions. So this is something I've actually learned about within the last year as well. So introductions, as you noted, like how we introduced ourselves at the beginning of this presentation, we talked about the things that we were wearing, our clothing, our hair, things like that, because those are really important um, things that we want to also be acknowledging. So like certainly a lot of folks have adapted the whole idea of I'm going to say my gender pronouns. That's awesome. That's really great in a lot of spaces and can really support LGBTQ people, but also understanding um, those from the disability community. If you can take that extra step in terms of acknowledging what you're wearing, those visual descriptions can be very, very helpful as well. Um, um, and so this is just another way, if you're presenting yourself in a space or if you're leading a dialogue, um, again, this can be another great way to show allyship and the way that you're supporting folks. 
Um, and then also just uh, using different types of language. So um, person first language, um, so that, some folks prefer that because it acknowledges the humanity of an individual. So you're saying person with a disability. So you're acknowledging this is a person, they just so happen to have a disability. Um, it also um, can, um, it also can acknowledge the um, your awareness that there is biased language, um, and then um, and then for some folks, disability first language um, is preferable because it acknowledges um, the oppressive uh, conditions or systems that are facing disabled folks um, in the community and in the environment, um, and then it also. Um, it's a way for folks with disabilities to take pride in themselves. Um, so I, I tend to kind of switch back and forth pretty often um, because I really don't really care that much. Um, but depending on the situation, I may um, explicitly use the word disabled or call myself disabled because I am acknowledging that the environment disables me as opposed to my body disabling me. Um, and then, um, so that's that's kind of why uh, there's been a lot of um, confusion, I think, in outside of the disability community as to why um, people use different language or which one they should use. Uh, you know, one day you're telling me to use this, the next day you're telling me to use that. Um, and so really, it is just a preference. So um, ask your students or the people around you just what they prefer and utilize that. All right, so next we're gonna get into a little bit of history. So certainly, as a lot of us should know, um, LGBTQ people uh, existed within higher education before Stonewall. Um, we've been around and within higher education for a very, very long time. As a matter of fact, the first uh, woman, uh, or the, what is it, the dean of women, uh, back within the history of higher education was actually um, a woman of color, but also queer identifying. So just a fun fact in terms of the first um, dean of women. But in terms of understanding um, LGBTQ existence, again, it's existed within higher education for a very long time, but the way that LGBTQ students could interact within their institution was very, very censored, very limited, um, and in terms of their ability to um, experience their institution, this is very, very different um, even before Stonewall happened. So students who did identify with the LGBTQ community um, were often suspended. They were referred to mental health professionals because being gay was referred to as a mental illness, um, and it was viewed as something that had to be cured. Um, there was also a lot of surveillance of students, so this was also in the time of in loco parentis, or in place of the parents, um, and so ultimately, um, it's something where um, college administrators were actually keeping an eye out for LGBTQ students and basically saying, like, you, you can't do that, like, that's not acceptable behavior within our campus community, and again, would either refer them to a mental health specialist or suspend them. Um, and then also, there was the refusal to recognize and suppress speech. So certainly, LGBTQ queer students um, tried to form organizations, try to make their voices heard, talk about their experiences, but often this was censored. Oftentimes, this was something that colleges and universities said, no, like, we're not gonna allow for this to take place on our campus. Um, and so ultimately, um, within their first early, you know, within the modern founding um, of higher education, it was pretty much LGBTQ students were not allowed. Um, and it was not until the 1960s, um, 70s, when um, there was movement for LGBTQ students within higher education. And Acacia is gonna talk a little bit about Stonewall and life after. So I'm not the expert on this topic, um, but uh, Stonewall um, was kind of the first collective movement um, of LGBT students um, on college campuses, um, and it kind of became the boiling point of the LGBT movement. Um, it kind of was a, a sort of a buildup of all of these individual things happening, and then um, folks just came together. Um, and then, um, the beginning of the gay rights movement, um, it's important to acknowledge, so that happened in the 1960s, it's important to acknowledge that um, it was often in majority, the majority of it was white male dominated and specifically um, often cis white. Um, the trans community wasn't always necessarily um, acknowledged within the LGBTQ, LGB, sometimes it was LGB instead of LGBT, if you, get what I mean. Um, uh, so it's important to acknowledge the perspective and the frame that, um, that the gay rights movement um, came from. And so there are, you know, there are still issues within that, but um, it was important that it was a step forward in the community. 
Yeah, and I think another really important thing to acknowledge uh, as we're looking over history is certainly um, while we're looking over LGBTQ history, um, a lot of it is very whitewashed in terms of um, trans women of color were the ones who started the Stonewall riots. It's um, women of color who were present and started the actual incidents and other following um, incidents that helped um, spring forward the LGBTQ community. Um, but ultimately, as um, leadership and as organizations started to spring up, as Akisha was saying, um, cis white gender or cisgender uh, white males ended up taking those leadership positions initially because because they felt like, well, we feel empowered to do something about it, and they seized um, based on their um, social capital and things like that, um, and access to spaces. Um, but certainly, as a lot of us know, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera were those who really helped spring forward the Stonewall movement, and were those um, who really helped to kick off the modern LGBTQ movement. Um, just a really important quote that we both thought was really interesting to share. Nearly a half century later, historians agree that although women of all races, gays and lesbians of color, and transgender and other gender nonconforming people of all races were active and present in the merging movement for gay rights, their identities and concerns were often subsumed by white gay men of means, leaving an incomplete record of their contributions and an overwhelming sense of their individual and collective marginalization in a historical record. The other important thing to know about all this as well is that as we have creation of affinity spaces, as we have student organizations that start to spring up, it's gay white males who end up leading those groups and end up making a space only for themselves and really make it very limited in terms of women of color, the trans population, to really feel a part of um, the beginning of the LGBTQ movement. So it's not to say that um, they weren't um, that mostly like the most important thing here is um, as the LGBTQ movement started, a lot of it was focused on one part of the population and did not deal with all the aspects of the LGBTQ community. So um, the first uh, time that, uh, or first place where affinity spaces were actually created, um, so things like um, LGBTQ centers, um, was at Univ the University of Minnesota. Um, they had uh, what was then called the Queer Student Cultural Center. Um, so it's, I think it's really important to note that they consider it a culture, calling it a cultural center. Um, uh, means a lot to the community in terms of um, acknowledging that there is culture or subculture within the LGBT community, um, even in different areas of the country, um, in different countries, things like that. Um, and then, and that happened uh, or occurred two months after Stonewall, so it was a really quick um, uh, kind of turnaround time. Um, the first student organization was at Columbia University. Um, they called it um, Gay People at Columbia Bernard. Um, so again, like recognizing that um, it was kind of male gay men dominated. Um, uh, but they did a lot of activism on campus, um, but they did struggle to recruit members, um, and they were condemned by their own institution. Um, the struggle to, to recruit members was a lot had a lot to do with um, folks not wanting to identify um, and not wanting to come out because there was danger. Um, there was a lot of there were a lot of assumptions, things like that. Um, and then strategies from the civil rights movement um, were used on many college campuses. So the creations of student groups um, and the ways that they uh, did they created their activism and movements on their campuses, um, and the ways that we, they worked to change institu institu institutional policies, um, and gathering support from faculty and staff. A lot of that kind of grew out of the civil rights movement. Yeah, and so I think as a lot of us know, as the world continues to turn, as it changes outside of our walls of our campus community, we see how that can impact our campus community. So um, as things occurred like Matthew Shepard within the AIDS crisis, within Pulse nightclub, like those things um, do come in and impact our students within our campus community. And so it's important that as we see that impact in the outside world, our students are very much so impacted as well. And so we can see this happening firsthand within our LGBTQ student experience and how they're impacted on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we're next gonna transition over to the disability rights community. And so I'm sure a lot of you are like, why are we talking about these separately? We will unpack that shortly. But in the interim, um, there's a couple different things, a couple different um, really big points that we wanted to talk about within the disability rights movement within higher education and how that's impacted the student experience. Uh, first being deaf education and American Sign Language. So American Sign Language was not allowed within um, institutions of learning, including K through 12 and higher education settings as well. Um, it was said that um, students had to adapt and that they had to learn um, to speak English and they just had to um, not use ASL as viewed as something other and they truly um, educators were other in students but then um, the means of, of education um, another um, really important one is Gallaudet College and so this was a college that is specifically designed for students who are hearing impaired um, and so um, students within the university um, had been there and there was not representation within their administration every single president um, was hearing capable um, and was um, not a part of um, the community and so ultimately students uh, had had enough of 
of that and protested and said, um, enough is enough. We need to have representation. Um, there was a finalist for a candidate who was going to be the president of the university who was um, hearing impaired, and they ended up going to somebody who can hear, um, who was also a white male, um, for the president of the university. Students pro pro protested and said, enough is enough. And so we need to have that representation within our institution. Um, another community that we really wanted to focus on was the return of veterans to our campus community. Um, oftentimes when we view our, our veterans, um, we talk about how um, how um, they come from many privileged identities when they first go off to war, but when they come back and um, if they are a part of the disability community, how often, how quickly they can be oppressed so quickly and how they lose so many um, rights and um, capabilities within um, society. Um, and so looking at how that played out, especially after World War II, um, was something that um, we noticed in terms of our research. Um, there's also a lack of access of resources um, and physical access on spaces, so students were unable to get into their residence halls. They were unable to get to class. They had to leave for um, class maybe like 45 minutes ahead of time of their peers just in order to get there on time. Um, and oftentimes there were not buildings that were set up for those who were not able-bodied within um, the campus community. And finally, again, viewing um, veterans as they return as a social burden, viewing them as, well, why do we have to do these things? Why do we have to go above and beyond for our institution? Why do we need to build ramps and things like that for um, folks within institutions of higher education, and so there was this deficit mindset in terms of how they're viewing um, their students who were coming back. So again, taking a look at um, how um, veterans um, became very quickly oppressed as soon as they came back, and we see this uh, playing out in terms of World War II within Vietnam, um, and as we have an influx of veterans coming to our campus communities due to the GI Bill. Interesting how not a lot has changed since uh, the 70s, huh? Um, but uh, so the disability rights movement um, in higher education specifically centered around activism um, and the purpose was to integrate all students for with all disabilities um, and then and moving away from the medical model um, or the charity model um, so the we will go into this a little bit further but the medical model being that you are you are looking at students with disabilities from a medical perspective from a disability or diagnosis perspective um, charity models being oh we're doing such good things for these people because they are you know so unfortunate in their situations blah blah, blah. Um, and then we have the Americans with Disabilities ha Act or the ADA hopefully all of you know what that is um, that was uh, established in 1990 um, and so that also part of it was also to um, to specified how colleges and universities had to meet um, modern quote unquote standards um, for access to all facilities and services provided. So it kind of helped standardize um, what was necessary for colleges and universities to do on their campuses um, in, in instead of kind of interpreting it on their own. Um, there was still a lot of a lot of there was still a lot needed between the um, disability rights movement in the 70s and the ADA. Um, so that helped um, a little. <laughs> Okay, so the next piece that we want to talk about is why are these two communities talked about separately? Um, there is very, very little research in terms of talking about the intersection of these two identities. And so, um, unfortunately, the only way that we could really bring it all together is talking about these two separate, talking about these communities separately, but also where do they have a lot of common ground and a lot of commonalities in terms of their experience? And we'll also unpack a little bit in terms of um, ways that folks are continually, continually oppressed um, within their experience based on their social identities or the intersections of these identities. Um, so the first um, thing that we want to talk about with socialization. And so we talked about a couple different models of thinking, the first one being the moral model. And so the moral model really looks at folks um, who are born with a disability. Um, so it's based in um, faith-based model and in terms of folks are born within sin is basically the premise of this model and saying that um, folks who have a disability um, were born within sin and so that's why they have a disability. It's a very problematic way of viewing things, but that's how um, things were viewed using this model um, from the very like founding of our country within um, the beginnings of higher education and so forth. Um, we also have the medical model, and so the medical model is um, unpacking where um, folks with disabilities have to be cured, that there's something wrong with them. And certainly in understanding the, pre the premise of that idea, there's a lot of problematic things in terms of we have to cure them, and assuming that able-bodiedness equals normalcy based on this model. Um, and so again, two very problematic ways that um, disabled people are viewed, but this is again how folks um, were socialized and talk talked to, uh, or taught about the disabled community for a very long time. 
Um, we also want to talk about the social justice model, though. So the, so the social justice model is based around ableism. Um, and so this is, um, ableism is function to suppress those who have physical, mental, emotional, cognitive, or sensory abilities that fall outside of what is socially acceptable. Um, and so folks who continue that form of oppression are considered ableist. Um, the assumption of ableism, then, is able-bodiedness equates to normalcy or fitting into an ableist society. So again, kind of um, springing off of the whole idea of the moral and the medical models as well. It affects people on cultural, institutional, and in individual level. So when we're talking about social justice, we're talking about this from a, a very large social level. We're talking about social structures, the way that people are socialized, the way that um, our institutions are set up, how they don't support oppressed people. Um, and finally, in addressing ableism, ableism um, we really want to talk about supporting disabled students, educating others about oppression, and working to create structural and systemic change. So in doing social justice work, we're doing this work, we're advocating for these things on a day-to-day -day basis, but we're looking at it from that social, um, larger systemic structure, and so we want to see how does this impact people on a day-to-day -day basis, and again, what are those policies or procedures that we need to change to um, remove ableism from our institutions, or our structures within our world. I think it's also important to recognize that we are all ableist, all of us. Um, and so like, it's not something to necessarily be ashamed of, it's something to, um, to recognize and acknowledge and work uh, to combat um, because it's, it's kind of impossible um, at this point in our social situation for, for us to not be ableist at all. Um, and then, um, so we're talking when we're looking at disability justice. Um, disability justice looks into um, the oppression at intersecting uh, as intersecting with multiple forms of oppression. So that is in relation to socioeconomic identity, race, sexuality, gender identity, things like that. Um, and so pulled a couple of uh, quotes from. Um, so Mingus is uh, this first one is. Um, Mia Mingus is somebody who is uh, very big in the disability community um, and has kind of pushed a lot of the more modern um, disability rights movement type things. Um, and so she said, uh, we recognize that ableism is connected, tied up with, and mutually dependent on other systems of oppression and that we cannot end ableism without also ending white supremacy, economic exploitation, colonization, and gender oppression. Disability justice requires that we no longer build single issue analysis, but instead build frameworks that can hold the complexities of our lives. And so that really kind of acknowledges intersectional identities um, and how important it is that we work on all of these intersections um, and all of these identities at the same time and all these systems of oppression at the same time. Um, and then the, uh, the textbook called Disability in Higher Education is wonderful. I recommend all of you read it. Um, it's, it's great. I'm serious. <laughs> um, uh, for a textbook. <laughs> um, so uh, a quote from that says, proponents of this model will would focus on disabled students as people with many different yet, yet intertwined social identities and stress the importance of working together for change. So again, um, acknowledging intersectional identities and how important it is to uh, work on uh, combating all multiple forms of oppression at the same time. Okay, so next we want to talk about some current trends or things that um, we observe as intersection between these two communities. So um, first and foremost is the hypersexualization of LGBTQ people and the desexualization of disabled folks. Um, and understanding that um, when we're talking about sex education, we are only talking about it for able-bodied folks a lot of the time. And so what can we do to change that narrative? What can we do to change that dialogue? There are folks. Um, Andrew Gerza is one folk or one person that I know of um, who actually does a podcast based around um, being queer and also being a part of the disability community. And so that's another person that you could always look into outside of this space in terms of talking about um, what does it mean to be queer and also part of the disabled community from dating to sex to um, anything in between and really um, talking about that lived experience. Um, we also don't have a recognition of faculty and staff with disabilities. And so like very common across a lot of marginalized identities, um, there's not a lot of opportunity for mentors or role modeling and not a really a large amount of visibility as well. And so this is something that's incredibly important for students to be able to see who are the folks that I can see myself in and um, have overcome similar challenges or that I can even just relate to. Um, that's a really important thing. And so what are we doing to help bring faculty and staff into those conversations and really um, helping them feel welcome and helping our students feel welcome at the end of the day? Um, again, how are we introducing ourselves? So we talked a little bit about pronouns, but um, are you also talking about your appearance and how you physically are presenting yourself? So again, doing this within classes, within meetings, um, it's something where a lot of the times you have to be brave in terms of those moments, in terms of doing that on your own accord, but other people will pick up on those things. Um, and so again, having to take that first step in your day-to-day -day actions in terms of that. Um, also, how are we talking about campus resources? So um, we might have an LGBTQ center on campus, but is it also in a spot that's not accessible? A lot of college campuses, especially 
as these LGBTQ centers started to spring up on campus um, were up, like up a hill or required steps or something to get up and a lot of our um, non-able-bodied students were unable to access those spaces and so understanding um, what can we do to be the most inclusive and what can we do to create affinity spaces that are not only having these conversations but are also accessible um, and welcoming for our students. Um, also thinking about um, are we using correct names and pronouns within um, the medical industry so um, whether it's within the access center and whether it's um, a letter of um, recommendation or for an accommodation request are we using preferred name and pronouns um, but also within um, doctor's offices um, for students that have to go see a doctor are they using preferred names and pronouns and a lot of the time within the medical field they are not they're ignoring that sort of thing and so again paying specific attention to that um, within the current um, administration and under Betsy DeVos, a lot of student protections have been rolled back, um, specifically for students of color. Um, they're dis uh, disproportionately identified as disabled, um, and so they are um, often, not only is that funding taken away from um, within um, the disabled community, but then also students of color are being disproportionately identified to be um, disabled as well. Um, in addition though, the Office of Civil Rights within the Department of Education has dismissed a lot of systemic cases, um, just not even hearing them, saying we don't have time for this and this is not something that we wanna prioritize at this point in time, which again can say a lot in itself. Um, we also want to be acknowledging activism and how can we be supporting and assisting um, and being just visible as faculty and staff. So that could just be something where we're showing up to be in a space with our students or um, letting them know that we support them um, and just showing that we do care, um, even if we're not a part of those communities, showing that we do care and that we're invested into that student experience. And finally, um, we need to move away from access just being a minimal standard. We have to think about in terms of what can we be doing to um, create spaces that are universal and accessible for everybody. So universal design is a concept that actually focuses on that. Um, and there's a lot of literature about universal design, but essentially universal design is a concept or the premise that the space can be used by anybody regardless of social identity, um, disability, or anything along those lines. And so it's something that's welcoming for learning and then creating a space where everybody can feel welcome. Um, some more current trends, uh, so, um, oh, I guess we already talked about that. Um, <laughs> recognition of faculty and staff with disabilities, um, so specifically when we're thinking about equity for all, um, and uh, so often we remember to, and we often do a great job of serving students with disabilities, but are we serving our staff and faculty with disabilities equally or equitably um, as well? Um, and how is that functioning? Um, and then, um, Resource offices, um, some of them need medical professionals' opinions before providing assistance, so that is um, that goes speaks to the medical model again. Um, our access center has done a great job um, in kind of flexing that so that if you don't have uh, medical doc documentation at the moment, um, you can at least get started with some kind of accommodations while you're getting set up with your, um, your documentation because the priority is to serve the student with a disability, is to get that that person the equity that they need um, and then they can you know they have some time to work on getting that documentation a lot of students have to do testing that are that's really expensive um, because maybe they weren't offered that in K to 12 um, so it takes some time and it takes some money to be able to do that um, uh, disability resource offices, um, like we, like Amber talked about, may not use preferred pronouns um, and names ref when referring to students in reference letters. Um, and then some for in, at the access centers, um, disability resource centers across different campuses, some of the letter gen generating um, systems that we use don't have the option to um, to provide the student's uh, preferred name and preferred pronouns. Um, so it'll automatically generate with their uh, legal name or dead name. Um, so if, if their name hasn't been changed in the university system yet, um, and sometimes even if it has, because there are glitches. Um, and then, um, Yeah, so, so it prevents even even the offices that do want to do that and want to provide that option, um, it prevents them from being able to do that um, in a more kind of well-rounded way and um, in an equitable way. Um, and then um, we really do need more professionals to aspire to uh, work in disability resource uh, services um, rather than it being kind of a... a other duties as a sign type of thing um, in your different offices and things like that. Um, uh, kind of integrating disability resources and disability services into every, is every office is really important. 
um, and then um, resource offices needing more medical professionals. Um, a lot of access centers and re disability resource offices um, don't have anybody who has um, any experience in the medical side of things. So often they're just kind of going by what they've been told or what they what they, the systems have been set up for. Um, and then having to do a lot of research on their own based on what those disabilities are or what's fair to them and often just asking that student individually, um, you know, what works for you, which is great. They should be asking that, um, but they're, there aren't always um, a lot of options in terms of uh, creating a, um, an equitable experience across different campuses because every campus is doing what they've been doing for the last how many years. Um, and then, like we talked about, universal design, um, but creating an environment that can be accessed and understood um, and used to the greatest extent possible um, for everyone, regardless of age, size, ability, et cetera. Um, assessing technology used in classrooms and other learning environments is really important um, on our campuses to, um, to, to be able to provide those um, technologies that may work for different students. One thing that is not mentioned in here, but um, I found really, really powerful in just my own research was that um, within American Sign Language, there is not a lot of language talking about the trans community. And so there's actually a narrative um, that I'm more than happy to share with you all, um, but it's basically a transgender man who's signing out their experience in terms of they knew that they were transgender. Um, they knew that they um, did not identify as like, gay or bisexual or anything like that, um, but they didn't have the language to talk about it because there is no language to talk about that within American Sign Language. And so also understanding um, even within systems uh, that can be supportive, there can also be oppression that exists within that as well. And so understanding um, how that person did not have the means to even be able to talk about their lived experience because there was no way to be able to talk about that lived experience. Um, and so again, that's just another resource I'm more than happy to share, but um, just something I found really, really powerful in terms of how oppression can still exist um, within um, communities and even within means of support. Um, we've already talked a little bit about some of these models of thinking, so um, we're just going to, I think, move on um, to a couple of other things. But um, in terms of disability within higher education, um, we want to talk a little bit about um, just if, um, a couple of different quotes that really resonated with us. So um, again, pulling from disability in higher education, transgender people have higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation than their cisgender peers, as well as higher incidences of disability status and experiences of victimization or violence. These health and safety issues are compounded from many transgender and disabled people because of difficulty finding counselors with the ex uh, expertise and sensitivity to competently treat transgender individuals with ongoing medical or mental health concerns. So again, a pretty profound thought, thought in terms of um, folks with the uh, multiple ways that they're experiencing oppression can't find even the resources that they're looking for um, to feel supported um, across multiple identities. So another, um Another quote from this textbook that we thought was really great um, is, uh, for many transgender and genderqueer students with disabilities, discrimina dis sorry, discriminatory medical experiences serve as a barrier to accessing medical care for their disability, um, and in general, prior to arrival at college. These same barriers also exist during college for documentation purposes and ongoing care. As a result, institutions, particularly those in rural areas and located in states with limited resources, should develop relationships with medical and mental health care providers with experience meeting that med those medical needs of transgender students. Um, so what that means is uh, basically trans students um, and genderqueer students Non-binary students are um, often, because of their negative experiences in the medical field in the past, um, try their best not to go to medical for prof professionals unless absolutely necessary. So that's what that barrier is um, in terms of that. Um, and something cool to note is that uh, we will be hosting a gender affirming healthcare symposium on Monday, May 6th in the Cultural Center. Um, and so we're bringing together, um, a, because of this need that we've seen um, to in this, this lack of intersection, um, we're bringing together the healthcare um, healthcare providers in the field, um, as well as students, staff, and faculty on our campus um, to, to, to kind of work together and try new things, create new ideas, things like that. Um, we also want to talk really quickly, because uh, healthcare is a really important component of all this, um, just in terms of the disparity, in terms of uh, experience, especially within the healthcare industry. So a lot of uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual folks um, are documented to significantly be more uh, likely to delay or avoid medical care compared to those who are straight identifying. Um, this is not necessarily always because of they don't want to go to the doctor, but it's because of treatment, how they're viewed, and um, how doctors may um, interact or approach them or anything along those lines. 
folks of lower income or lower SES um, also have lower rates of health insurance. So the access to health insurance is very, very tough to get in the first place. Um, but in terms of the experiences that also folks of lower SES also have um, and the way that folks of lower SES might experience talking to a medical healthcare professional um, can also be very, very negative. And so again, very similarly, um, folks have negative experiences with our healthcare system as it is right now. We also have higher rates of mental health issues, including depression, anxiety, suicide ideation, and suicide completion within the LGBTQ community. Um, so again, um, something that um, has to be well known, well documented, and we have to have these conversations about because we have to do more to support folks. And there's also a higher use of alcohol, tobacco, and illicit drug use as well, um, which again stem from ex um, extenuating um, circumstances for folks. But again, um, understanding how folks of marginalized identities may um, end up getting less care and may need um, the care that's more supportive for their experience. So really quickly, we're going to talk a little bit about some action items. So what are things that you or I or we can do as a community um, to help further these uh, needs? Um, so asking questions, number one, just, just ask questions. Ask your students, ask your staff and faculty, um, ask people what they need or what their experiences are. You know, just finding out what a lived experience um, has been is so uh, impactful in terms of understanding um, and being able to better empathize and better take care of your students or your peers. Um, um, who may be at this intersection in particular. Um, doing some research on your own. Um, so uh, one thing I often get is when I say my diagnosis, immediately people respond with, um, what's that? Tell me all about it. Teach me about this thing. Um, and, and, and that's great if you can hear it from my perspective, but also like I would really appreciate it if I don't have to do my 10 minute speech every time. Um, so like, you know, like Google it and come back to me and we can talk more. <laughs> um, it's, uh, that sounds kind of rude, but like, you know. Um, <laughs> and then including um, topic, these topics of con in conversation, um, in future conversations around social justice, ableism, heterosexism, cisgenderism, et cetera, um, incorporating all of these different ideas and that intersectional concept, concept of intersectionality um, in those conversations. Making it a habit to include your pronouns and a quick description like we did at the beginning of your appearance when you're introducing yourself. Um, visit the Access Center and visit GSORC. Uh, find out more about what they do um, and what opportunities, what resources they provide um, is, is a really great way to get some quick information. Um, and then read, 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 read a lot. Um, articles, blogs, everything. Um, YouTube is a really great way to gather information as well. Um, if reading, whether that is visually, braille, um, uh, technology, um, those are great ways to, to gather information, but YouTube can also be a really, a, another way that is maybe a little bit more um, interactive or a little bit less dull <laughs> in gathering information. Um, and then also understanding and getting to hear other people's individual lived experiences at the same time. Um, and then listen to folks' stories and believe them. Like, just believe, them. I know it sounds silly to have to say that, but really, like, there's a lot of denial and a lot of um, gaslighting that happens in both of these communities, nonetheless at this intersection of these communities. So just believing them and letting them know that you believe them is a really impactful way for them to feel supported. Um, and then providing platforms to, for folks to sh continue sharing their stories and having those conversations as well. So we realized that was a ton of content and in a very short amount of time. So we really appreciate your all's attention and your ability to learn and just being open in this space. But we really do want to open up this time for any questions. Um, I think we have time for maybe like three or four questions. Um, so any questions that folks have, again, this is a safe space for learning and um, we want folks to feel um, comfortable in terms of um, asking any questions that they might have at this point in time for Acacia or myself. Yeah.
Yeah, so the question was, um, students um, within the LGBTQ and within the dis uh, disability community have a hard time uh, maybe wanting to identify with their communities or maybe struggle to find spaces where they can feel safe and supported. And so what can we do as educators and as folks um, within the campus community do to create an inclusive and safe space? Do you have any thoughts? Sure. Um, so one thing in terms of um, those of you that may identify within either of these or both of these uh, communities is, is to talk about it, be okay with it, be proud of your identities and be proud of your situations. Um, and, or if you have those visible, if your identities are more visible, um, no, acknowledging that people see you um, is really important. And so opening up conversation, being okay with talking about it um, is a great way to just start with that. Um, and then those of you that may not be within these identities, um, like we said, asking questions um, to folks, kind of just, just normalizing it, um, reducing stigma, and that means talking about it, and that means talking about it as in, in very normalized ways. Um, maybe instead of assuming somebody is not disabled, assuming that people are neurodiver neurodiverse or body diverse, um, assuming that, that somebody may be within one or both of those communities, um, or, or just phrasing things in ways that, um, that assume that somebody may be in any of those identities. Um, reducing the stigma in your classrooms and in your residence halls and anywhere um, in, within any of these identities. Um, so, you know, host, hosting programs, um, things like that. I'm <laughs> yeah, I think the other side of this too is like sometimes folks don't always want to um, identify the community maybe due to like safety or just due to like um, systemic laws or anything like that in place that would really jeopardize like their safety or anything like that. Um, and sometimes folks just really, um, it might not be a salient identity or sometimes being invisible is sometimes like a preference. Like I know sometimes it's like a trans woman. Sometimes I'm like, you know, like I just want to navigate my day and not like have to like out myself every single time I'm like navigating a space and like just like navigating my day as like a woman is always like kind of great too. So I think sometimes just like understanding that like um, that sense of invisibility is not that they don't want to be a part of it, but sometimes that can also be a preference for folks as well. Um, I think the other side of this too though is like what are you doing as an institution or what are you doing as a society or um, anywhere really to create spaces where folks know that like if they want that space that they are welcome and that all folks are welcome um, regardless of their social identities and that they can really um, have those spaces within their campus community so by having this space it shows that um, we as an institution do support this and that we're willing to have these conversations even if um, you know we're not perfect in everything at least we're starting and we want to um, learn and grow and understand what can we be doing to do better um, and so ultimately I think having those spaces available creating those spaces where um, folks of those identity groups can come together and talk and maybe not always having um, faculty or staff who are always present um, who may not share those identities and just being able to talk and just be in community can also be super super important as well so I think um, there's a lot to kind of unpack with that question but I think um, understanding that could be coming from a lot of different experiences based on people's lived experience and how they're navigating their community but that's a really great question other questions or things that like we can continue to talk about yeah Yes, so there's some microphones in the center. Um, yeah. Um, so I was just wondering about why you describe your appearance at the beginning of your talk. So yeah, so that's a really great question. So again, um, I think for that one, um, the uh, value in that is really helping everybody feel included. Um, so not everybody is able to see. Um, and so understanding um, who that person is, so that way um, they have a good idea of um, who that person is and understanding um, how they're presenting themselves. Um, presentation can be a really, really important component. Um, and so understanding how you're presenting yourself in a space can be um, really imperative and also help folks feel like they can connect in the space and the speaker and um, at the time and place and also know that they are supported and it's again part of that allyship component um, did you have anything that you would add to that? Okay. any other questions yeah sorry so far away oh can you hear me? Yes. All right, awesome. Um, so uh, I'm a faculty member here, and I want to say thank you so much to both of you um, for, for this conversation, this discussion today. 
it was really informative and I, I wish that more of my colleagues could have been present today um, from the faculty side of things. And one of the things that I really appreciated that you brought up was this concept of calling in and not calling out. And I really do think that, um, especially for a lot of our faculty, there is fear in language use and um, how do we approach different situations. And I, I really appreciated that idea of calling in. How do we foster that culture here at WSU? Um, especially among our faculty of, of calling in and not calling out because I think that that fear is is inhibiting and I think that it continues and perpetuates oppression as you were talking about. Um, so how, how do we do that tangibly? What does that look like? Sure. Um, so I think uh, one important way of doing that is um, like we talked about, just continuing to have these conversations, bringing these up um, in informal conversations with your peers and with other faculty members of just like, oh, hey, did you make it to the disability symposium? Like, oh, I went to this thing, it's really cool, they talked about this. So just kind of continuing this conversation that we're having today um, throughout other conversations with other peers. Um, also, we're, um, I host faculty, um, uh, uh, faculty workshop series, um, and this is in, this particular one is, in one of the is one of the series that we offer one of the programs that we offer um so you can bring me out us out um to do more of these conversations with your peers as well um and then um also i think sometimes it's just starting with asking them you know oh why did you say this or where did that come from or you know why are you um it seemed like you were really afraid to use this particular language and you couldn't figure out what you wanted to say. Why is that? Can we talk about that? Um, how can I help you to understand this better? Um, or how can we work on it together? Um, I love having accountability buddies. That's one of my favorite, like I should have put that on there. Um, one of my favorite recommendations is having accountability buddies because it allows you to understand each other without having to have that conversation each time um, and being able to check each other in your language. Um, and it helps you to kind of pr um, start to automatically use specific language rather than others. Um, so for me, it has been a lot of the um, ableism language um, that I've been trying to completely cut out of my language um, and my vocabulary. So, so things like um, that's crazy or that's insane. Um, instead of using that, I would say like something that's more accurate. <laughs> um, and so saying stuff like that's wild or that's um, ironic or you know like being more specific and being more creative in your language uh, being being more accurate in your language um, and people will catch on um, because they will want to say like that's crazy or they'll expect you to say that and they'll be like oh like you said something different why um, or you can again have those conversations with them of like oh why did you, why do you think that's crazy like why do you think that's insane why do you think that's Blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, again, kind of just opening up those conversations more. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah, I think Akisha has summed up a lot of really, really good points. I think the only other thing that I would also acknowledge is like, as we're learning about these conversations, like again, like like we talked about from the very beginning, the conversation is not like a one and done sort of thing. And so understanding that learning is a super vulnerable experience. Like, I mean, it's a really hard thing to do where it's like, I don't know. And like for folks, like that can be a really tough thing to like admit sometimes. Um, and so understanding that um, it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to have those moments where it's a learning opportunity and accepting that as a learning opportunity and maybe not internalizing that. Um, I do think that the other side of this too is like understanding um, that when we are calling folks in, like maybe unpacking like the impact of, um, you know, the things that you just said, like they were racist or they were ableist or they were transphobic, like kind of helping them unpack and get like a better understanding. Um, so that way we're calling them back in as members of our community and saying like, hey, like so, you know, again, we're all socialized, you know, we learn these really problematic things, so I need to call you back in as, like, a member of our community and help you understand that. And I think helping people understand in terms of um, why that language is problematic is also super, super important, so that way we're not, um, you know, protecting them from anything that, you know, we, we all need to, like, understand um, that sort of thing and um, understand the roots of some of the really problem problematic ways that we see the world and stuff like that. One last thing, also bring your friends to disabled staff and faculty and allies, or we have a student group <laughs> called, I forget, it keeps changing, what's the name? <laughs> yeah. Disabled Students and Allies Club. Every year it changes, anyway. Um, so if you're a student, bring your friends to that. Um, you can talk to Cameron, is Cameron in here? 
Cameron's right here. You can talk to him for that cl uh, club. Or if you're a staff faculty, um, you can talk to me or Tyler in the back about disabled staff and faculty and allies. Um, so yeah, just putting that plug in there. Um, I think we're out of time though. Um, so who's taking the, yeah. Well, thank, thanks to uh, both Acacia and Amber. It was uh, wonderful, learned a lot. Uh, one thing that I learned is that I don't think I shared my pronouns. Uh, she, hers, herself. And I'm wearing, uh, I'm really stepping it up today. I'm wearing, um, a, let's see, a, a beige sweater and um, velvet pants and polka dot shirt. So, but, but I do appreciate that. Um, I think that even the, I do this work day in, day out, and I don't always think about these things. And so uh, it's really helpful for me to hear a lot of these things. Um, now it's time for lunch. And so I encourage you to um, get some food. We have a taco bar and hopefully it will meet everyone's um, dietary needs. And, um, and please feel free to mingle, sit with folks you haven't sat with, get to know folks, continue the conversation. And um, at one o'clock, we're going to have networking and sharing in here as well, with a focus on disability in the media. And Ben Shores from uh, Murrow College will be joining us as well during that time. So thanks. Please um, enjoy your lunch. Thank you.
Thank you.
our next guest. Um, Mark Leeper is with us. He's, from, he's the executive director of the Disability Action Center in Moscow, Idaho. And he and I go way back. We've known each other for a long time. And he's done some amazing work um, on behalf of uh, people with disabilities. And um, so I'm so glad that he um, agreed to come and share with us his, um, his knowledge and his, his thoughts about shades of disability in, in the media. Painful reminders and pleasurable trends. So give a warm welcome to Mark Leeper. Thank you. You are so welcome. I have room to set this, this without I spilling it on so. both computers. <laughs> well, thank you and welcome and uh, I just came back uh, from uh, Acacia's presentation and uh, uh, well done. And one more demonstration of this topic being so broad that we could spend literally a couple of days on it. And uh, so I, uh, I was asked to kind of put together a presentation and not really knowing what other folks were talking about. And so interestingly enough, some of what I'm going to talk about will dovetail nicely with what Acacia mentioned in hers. And that is uh, some discussion of disability in news stories and what we tend to see. So what I want to talk about is, you know, a question mark. I don't know how many shades of disability there are in the media. There could be 50, but that's been used. And so I didn't want to step on that. And actually, I have to take responsibility for having stolen this idea. I loved it uh, when I was in an Americans with Disabilities Act symposium, and a person from the federal government came up, and the first slide was complete with the black, the cross, uh, the lines on it, and it was 50 shades of the ADA. And so I thought, well, that was great. Anybody to get up in front of a brand new audience, especially when you're a member of the former federal government. Um, then you uh, would do those things, and uh, so it was great. So anyway, painful reminders of what's happened in the past, uh, with some exceptions, and uh, pleasurable trends. So let me see if I can figure out how all of this works. Um, well, I think I can probably just, I don't do windows. So F5. F5. Well, there is a clicker, and if I can figure out how to use that. Ah, oh, there we go. How about that? So, first of all, first and foremost, why talk about media portrayal of disability? At the risk of blinding anybody off the top of my head, I'll take my hat off. Um, so, thinking about movies and books and so on, how many times have they led the movement? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's, I guess I should have done that. That would be way more better. Yay. All right. And it even has a cheater slide, so I can see what the next one is, because I tend to look, do, I, actually, I would say I create these slideshows. I started creating it, and then another person creates it because I get lost and thinking all over the place because I'm kind of an array thinker. So I also tend to talk over my slides, so uh, forgive me, I'll get back to them. Um, so movies and books and all sorts of stuff have sometimes led a movement for change. They're a catalyst for change. And then I'm also kind of wanting to think about the times when movies and books have cemented or distorted um, some change or some idea. 
And a lot of this happens through various media, news, movies, um, and really make a difference. And I'll have a couple of examples in a moment that have absolutely nothing to do with disability. Um, and think about media, movies, news stories, that so many of them fall kind of somewhere in between. There's some good and there's some bad. And some of that was talked about in media portrayals in the last workshop where they talked about characters in movies. Um, was it a good portrayal? Was it a bad portrayal? Well, those are really broad things. Was it effective? Was it ineffective? Was it real? Was it fanciful? Well, some of them are fiction, and fanciful, fanciful is, is the name of the game. But what aspect of it maybe crossed the line and perpetuated some image, kept change from happening? And what of them maybe boosted change? Many, many examples. Well, media sometimes leads the way. And whether it's television, whether it's movies, whether it's a news story, sometimes it can have a huge impact. And I see a man taking a picture, and it's just reminded me, if I don't record some of this, I have a staff member who's going to uh, be very unhappy with me. So bear with me one moment. I have to figure out, remember how to do that. There we, I think I can do that this way. Um, there we go. Uh, so um, example of when social change was driven and really preceded by a television show. And let's see if anybody recognizes this. Anything interesting about that photo? Anything shocking about that photo? Not nowadays, right? I mean, it's really not. We see, actually, very recently start to see, as a matter of course, interracial couples and so on in advertising and in, 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 in movies more so, but in advertising especially, just kind of a natural course of things. This was absolutely, incredibly groundbreaking at the time. This had never been done, and it was exceptionally controversial. And I would suggest that it led a movement for change. It was ahead of its time, but it was forecasting the time, as so many things Star Trek did, you know, uh, at the time. I mean, here's our communicators. And uh, I just want mine to turn into a phaser. That'd be fun. Set on stun, depending where I was at. Uh, anyway, so Star Trek led the way. And this is a good example of the power of television, the power of media uh, to be able to do that. What about times when media has held something back? Anybody think of an idea that really significantly, a significant social issue, something that's been slowed down because of perception? We might say some things related to the whole intersectionality, that there's been various things over time that have cemented or seem to uh, cement uh, stereotypes. But perhaps one of the most notable, and particularly for places like Colorado and Washington State, what about reefer madness? How much impact has this one stupid flick had on a nation in terms of its view on marijuana? Reefer madness is still looked at by some groups. And let's face it, we've got some groups that aren't really all that with it in this country. Um, I would hazard a guess that maybe they're not at the leading edge of, of what academics are talking about. But that whole attitude, that whole notion of reefer madness, that idea that this gateway drug will re lead to horrible societal trends, still impacts our public policy, right? Powerful stuff. And so as we start to look at things in the media, particularly if we're kind of activist in nature, then we have to really take it seriously and think, what are we perpetuating and what are we leading a change on? Yes. Uh, Star Trek was, um, 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 that was about 1967, I think, somewhere around that time, mid-60s. Yeah, mid-60s. Um, it, was, it was incredible. Star Trek did some cool stuff. Um, so Reefer Madness was 1936, and it's still having an impact, I suspect. So I really wanted to stress the portrayal of disability in the media is a serious issue. 
as evidenced by this Callahan cartoon with the wheelchair in the desert and the posse, uh, don't worry, he won't get far on foot. Um, there is a movie about Callahan, John Callahan, out, uh, um, Oregon native uh, and uh, cartoonist. Um, anyway, I just kind of threw that in because, you know, words and attitudes and ideas. And sometimes we have to lighten up um, in, our, in our groups. Uh, think of words you might see or hear in the news. And I really want you to think about it because I'm going to ask that question. So what do the words you say about disability? Are they positive, negative, or neutral? So what kind of things might we expect to see in the media? What word would you see to describe a person with a disability in a news story? In case you... Inspirational. inspirational. Person is inspirational. What's another word that you might see? A story about a person with a disability. Inspiring. Inspiring. Suffers, from. Suffers from. Could be a phrase you'd see in a news story, right? Wheelchair bound. Oh, yeah, wheelchair bound. That's been around a long time. Others? What other? Courageous? Brave. They're brave. Oh, they're horribly brave, yeah. And extraordinary. They've overcome, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It could, it's, it's amazing. Truly amazing. Superhuman. Anything else? I mean, there's a bunch, right? So how many of the words that you might see, what about special? You ever see special? What about retarded? What about brain damaged? What about afflicted? Confined? Okay. A lot. How many words do we see in the media that we would really intrinsically say are positive words? Very many? I think a lot of them are dramatic, so they're positive, but uh, So a positive word on the surface, but euphemize the way it's used ends up being limited. Because courageous and brave, those are great words in and of themselves, right? would see something as, as somebody, you know, I, to me, they're nuts, but if they climb a mountain, free climb a mountainside, that's pretty courageous, that's pretty brave. Um, but if they do it, if they're blind, that's really, that's really courageous and really brave, right? Or if they do it, they, they have somebody pack them up there because they use a wheelchair and then they wheel over parts, that's inspiring. So there's all these words in the media. And so these are things we kind of look at and we think about because as has been suggested, a word in and of itself is just a word. It's how it's used and how it's applied. And interestingly, in the world of disability, there's a lot of discussion about words. So we've really stressed this notion of person first. I'm a person with a disability. I'm a person who experienced limited blah, blah, blah. And this has kind of been the litany that, that we've, and me included, that we've carried on in the disability community. And some of that narrative is actually starting to change. I still remember when I first started out, and I didn't do a very good job about talking any of my history, so here's a little blurb. I've been executive director of Disability Action Center for a long time, and I worked there since about 1983, off and on. And um, I came to it because I've, you know, probably bought a Cadillac for a psychiatrist or two in my day of time, a, a day, a lifetime, a day, maybe a day, I don't know. Prices are high. But anyway, um, so one of the first things I taught, because we sink our teeth into this when you're an activist, I realized that the disability rights movement was a social movement. It's a human rights movement. It's, it's exciting. And so I started looking at this stuff very seriously. I said, you know, people first stuff. And I remember a Daily News article way back in the day, and it said, wheelchair-bound woman hooked on water skiing. I thought, oh my God, that's got to be illegal in some states. Because they bound her up in a wheelchair, and somehow they've got her on a hook, and they're dragging her. I mean, this is horrible stuff. So I wrote a letter to the editor, and I said, the glasses-bound staff at the, the, or the computer screen. And I don't know that they had computer screens at the time. Maybe they just did. But anyway, so that was, I took it really seriously. And I used to chastise people a lot. Well, kind of interestingly now, a lot of this has changed because some groups of people with disabilities don't like this person first stuff. Um, autistic adults, there's a whole movement 
I'm not a person with autistic, autism. I'm an autistic adult. I'm an autistic person. Um, and so people are starting to take some ownership of the condition. And that kind of takes a lot of the power out of it, right? And so it's kind of cool. And you see the same thing, of course, with the LGBTQ and lots of other things that I'm not even going to try to throw in there because I get myself confused. But you see this sense of we want the identity. This is part of our identity. By God, we're proud of it. And so is that showing up in the media? So that's a, that's a major question. So we talked about this one, and it's one of my favorites. Some terms just keep on rolling along. They keep on rolling along. Wheelchair bound, confined to a wheelchair. Is it a country western song, or is it illegal imprisonment? I don't know. It's, I think it could be put to a good, Dan, you could end up putting it to a good guitar riff. I'm wheelchair bound. I'm wheelchair bound. Anyway, heading out to wheelchair. No, not going to happen. Never mind. Anyway, I mean, this is, it is silly language. You know, but it's still used. KXLY News uses it a bunch. Um, so here's the local news, July 24th in 2017 from uh, Nadine Woodward, I believe it was, up in the KXLY. A freak accident altered the lives of a North Idaho family forever, and now that family is seeking help paying for mounting medical debt. What a shame we have to do that in this country. Uh, Jesse Raymond was spending a June day on the water when he dove into the Snake River and hit his head on a rock, leaving him wheelchair bound. And so... Uh, so that shouldn't be around anymore. It really shouldn't. Because, again, it connotes that somehow that person is left limited by that wheelchair. In fact, as we always tell folks, that person was freed by that wheelchair, by that piece of technology. What binds us up is that there aren't any damn curd cuts. <laughs> and there's too many stairs, and Sellas rebuilds their stairs, but they don't put in a ramp. So those are the things that we wish would go away. And Krim News actually does much better, to be honest. It's kind of interesting as you start looking at them. So we had a lot of history in the news. So here's some of that real um, um, painful past. This goes back, way back, to the Second World War, before the Second World War, in Germany. This person suffering from hereditary defects costs the community 60,000 Reichsmark during his lifetime. Fellow Germans, that is your money too. And there's the image of obviously somebody in a chair who appears to be feeble-minded. So that's disability in the media. Eugenics as a public health stance is still debated Um, Dr. Ada E. Schweitzer commented, you cannot make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, neither can we make a citizen out of an idiot or any person who is not well born. And to prove that, they had beautiful baby contests where in the Illinois State Fair, for example, you could win a $100 prize if you had the most perfect baby. Please, nobody with an illness or congenital defect allowed. Those are real things in the media. Here's something a little newer that maybe we all, if we're activists in nature, ought to be doing something about. Has anybody seen ads for a Spokane hyperbaric chamber? Let me see if I can get this to play. Will this actually, uh, will this launch into a YouTube? Let me see. Oops. There we go. These are my wheels. After traumatic brain injury in 2004, I couldn't get around on my own. My body moved slower, my brain moved slower, and my hands shook. Then my parents took me to the Spokane Hyperbaric Center, and after each treatment, I became stronger. Now, I play basketball, and I can do math problems. I'm even learning to play guitar. The Spokane Hyperbaric Center. Call them today. It'll change your life. Now I've got to figure out how to get back there. Uh-oh. 
My God, what have I done? Sorry, I will skip ahead here. <laughs> so, um, what do you think? Great ad, huh? I mean, it's a, no, it's a great story. I mean, it's, it's a great thing that people can get. And I've heard, I had a board president for years and years who had some, some staph infections and he ended up in the hyperbaric, and it was really helpful. These are great medical things. But what an image. We have a picture of a wheelchair, an old wheelchair. It's not a sporty wheelchair. It's not a nice wheelchair. It's kind of a broken down medical looking wheelchair out in the middle of some woods. Obviously, it's been discarded. So... What image does that send to all of the Spokane viewing audience? Is it a positive image about disability? Are we doing anything about it? I just had a discussion with a staff member this morning, and I believe we were going to be doing a workshop up in Post Falls, and this will be the subject of it, where we're kind of inviting people. Is this something that maybe we should be a little bit more activist about? Should somebody be contacting the Spokane Hyperbaric Chamber? Should there be a group maybe writing some letters and saying, we don't like this portrayal? This isn't an image. We think we, we love what you do. We need your services. But can we maybe have a little bit more honest portrayal of people thinking about those for whom your hyperbaric services will not discard that wheelchair. So, it's just a thought. Um, so, I need some technical assistance because uh, this apparently is locked in on um, the last one. Bless you. So I've got this here, but I wonder if I, ah, there we go, okay, you're back. Okay, awesome, thank you. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to trigger this one. So the next issue I wanted to talk about, now that we've seen uh, some advertising and how they do, is how does the news report stories? Um, and not just in general, because I think sometimes it's, it's a sticky wicket, exactly what you do. I saw ESPN had an E60 program yesterday on that um, Saskatchewan hockey team that uh, I believe a number of them were killed in an accident, and one of them uh, is now using a wheelchair. And so it was a story, you know, and it had the kind of the usual stuff in there. It was, you know, I mean, it's tough. It, nobody can take away that that's a difficult thing. And they actually then got through. This guy's learning to play sled hockey because he loves hockey. And so it's great. And so it was kind of, kind of a cool story. Sometimes we see things in sports, and they're picked up by media that are not quite so good. Um, here's an example. For these kids, it doesn't matter who scored the touchdown. Both teams celebrated the victory. During a high school scrimmage in Georgia on the final play of the game, watch Seth McGee, who has Down syndrome, score an amazing 65-yard touchdown. Then 
and every one goes wild. After the game, the players congratulated him in person. Now that's what you call school spirit. For InsideEdition.com, I'm Leisha. See, my Christmas gift, gift uh, list is getting longer. Um, so, what do you think? We see a lot of those, right? Somebody comes in, they allow them to score a touchdown, they bring in the team manager for the last minute of the basketball game, and they get to shoot a basket. How do you all feel about that? Patronized? Patronized? But they talk to the parents, and the parents are in tears, and they, oh, my God, it was the most wonderful. And they talk to the person, oh, my God, it was a great experience. I loved it. Being patronized is not always uncomfortable. Yeah, that's actually one of my board members. That's one of his, every time one of these is on, he sends me the link. And, and uh, I wish we could do something about it. But it's hard. We get into that whole discussion of special, right? How many people have heard about Special Olympics? How many people saw the outcry at the reduction of funding in the budget over Special Olympics? Did anybody feel like that wasn't quite their most important issue? That's a hard one, isn't it? Because that's a really, really popular national thing, but it stresses special. Everybody gets a ribbon. And so when everybody gets a ribbon, what happens in real life? Does, that, does everybody get a job? Does everybody make minimum wage, at least? So there's a whole thing, a whole narrative that starts to happen, and that kind of ties into all of my work at Disability Action Center, that activist side. There's that narrative that happens that limits us as people. So while it may seem like an inspirational thing, it may seem like it's a great thing for that person, and it likely is. The overall damage, the overall harm, may be much, much greater than that benefit is worth. At least us. It may not be to that person's family, and that's what makes these things so awfully difficult. I was once, we actually ran the transportation program in the city of Moscow which was not much of a transportation program when you consider uh, that uh, Pullman's transportation, public transit is in the millions and Moscow's was around 100,000 at that time. And uh, so actually Pullman's transportation system is roughly the same as Boise, uh, a city in an area of, of uh, far, far greater size, of course. Um, so anyway, we had the transportation program and I had a board member they felt like, wouldn't it be great if we could have a van for at least Friday nights, maybe some of the kids, they called them kids, because they were their kids, we could go to a movie. And I said, you know, it'd be really great if everybody had an opportunity. We should try to see if we can get some funding so we can have a van operate, but we don't want to have it just for one group. And she was really offended. I think at that point, I became her public enemy number one because I would limit the access of her youngster because I was concerned about the image of special and that this was a dedicated service for those people. And anytime I think you can apply the term those people, I think we have a problem because we've seen that when we apply the term to those people to groups all over. I had an American Indian friend that he used to always talk about people being well-meaning for those people, he said. 
And of course, that's our example when we talk about disability in the media. We have other groups who've shared many of the same types of stereotypes, right? And so that's part of what we, we, uh, we battle. So these are things we wish we would not see, and I don't know how to deal with that. And I'm not sure how to deal with special Olympics and special things like that. It's true that people need to have, and they ought to have, we ought to provide for folks an opportunity to interact with others. That we shouldn't just have vocational workshops as being the only place where people with a significant developmental disability can get together at sub-minimum wage. We ought to be doing that, but we ought to call it what it is. If it's athletic competition, then I really think most folks can handle winners and losers. It goes with the territory. It's kind of what athletic competition is all about. So I wish, in a sense, that these news stories could show that sort of thing. And that's an interesting thing to think about. Again, we can't cover it all. And there are so many of these. And I say there's basketball, there's football, there's all sorts of things. And of course, it crosses over. Of course, we have women who also, women playing men's sports. Oh my god, what a great news story. But we do that, right? So, because news by its very nature is biased. It's biased to sell a product. And that's what we have to most remember. So, uh, anyway, that's kind of an interesting aside. Uh-oh, now it's kicking over this one. It's not kicking over this one. Uh. Help. My controller starts to control one screen, but not the other, so I... All right, I think so. I think we're... All right, there we go. So, what about movies and TV shows? We actually talked about this in the past, uh, the last presentation. Acacia talked about these things. But what about movies and the portrayal? And I won't spend much time on this because we already kind of talked about it. But it is important to remember, is it an angry villain? Is it the old wheelchair user, the old guy who was always really crotchety and he wants to knock off somebody? Um, Ray Milland in the old movies and uh, various folks. Or a pitiful character. God bless us, everyone. What are they saying? What about the, oh my God, I'd rather die than have a disability? Now me, I just want a sporty chair. I don't want that one that's sitting out in the woods that the hyperbaric chamber shows. So movies like Million Dollar Baby. Everybody see Million Dollar Baby? What happens with Million Dollar Baby at the end? She can't take it, right? She can't live with a disability, and so suicide. And so we see that a lot. Um, Me Before You, that was a movie I think that came up in the other uh, workshop, if I'm not mistaken. Um, where again, you know, you don't want to be a burden. But this is repeated. It's, we've seen it for years and years in movies. And sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes maybe that's a choice somebody makes. But it's the matter of how we portray it that really has an impact. So there's some fairly good examples about, and I say fairly good, because none of them are per perfect. Um, Forrest Gump, that was one that was interesting. But what about Forrest? I mean, Forrest, it brought in, Forrest did a lot of things, obviously very improbable. But what characteristic did Forrest maintain mm, throughout the time? Kind of a positivity, he was positive. What Innocence, he was really innocent, right? Because people like that maintain their innocence. They don't know when their best friend's father is abusing them. They do something, but we don't know about that stuff, but we can have sex and make a baby. So there's some things in there, that are, there's some kind of holes in the system. But overall, what about Lieutenant Dan? Lieutenant Dan? Lieutenant Dan actually is kind of an interesting portrayal because when you really think about what people do really go through, I mean, in a sense, we kind of cringe in a way 
But in reality, I've known a lot of folks that have acquired a disability, and they really do go through stages of grief. They really do go through, through those hopeless times. Uh, and everybody's different. Of course, that's the other thing that sometimes the movies don't let us know, right? That every one of us is different. Um, so in for, Lewis, Lieutenant Dan does pretty He ultimately gets some really, really expensive prosthetic legs, thanks to Bubba, Bubba Gum Shrimp. But... Uh, but all in all, not a bad portrayal. There's another one we talked about, interestingly, because uh, an old guy like me remembers way back with Raymond Burr. He used to be uh, Perry Mason, and then after he was Perry Mason, Raymond Burr ended up in a wheelchair because he was shot and hit in the spine as a police officer, and so he ended up, I'm sure at the time, confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound. And wherever he was wheel bound to, he arrived in a wheelchair. And the neat thing about it, actually, is it was actually a fairly positive portrayal. And interestingly, it was remade recently uh, with Blair Underwood. Uh, so it got away from the white straight male non-disabled person in a wheelchair, and it came on with an African-American non-disabled male in a wheelchair. Um, but it's still an interesting portrayal because even back at the time, I mean, Ironsides, that was kind of a whole thing about the name and the Ironsides and, you know, obviously because of the wheelchair and the steel, you know. And, but in actual fact, every episode was about this cop that was really good. And he was a good cop. And sometimes he'd run into stuff where the wheelchair was a real hassle. I mean, he got, you know, couldn't get someplace or he got stuck or knocked out of his chair. But in reality, it was just a part of the show. And so for something that actually aired in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, it did pretty good. And again, it was remade. I'm not sure. Anybody familiar with the new Ironside? I'm not sure whether it ever hit the airwaves or whether it's a Netflix thing or whatever. But it's out there. And again, it was really lambasted by the disability community because it doesn't include people with a disability. When there are a lot of chair users out there, potentially, who would have happily taken the role, I am Sam. Everybody remember that with Sean Penn? Anybody seen that? I am Sam is a story about a mentally disabled man, Sean Penn, has an intellectual disability, and he and another young woman have a child. The child is non-disabled, um, but the mom leaves, and Sean Penn ends up raising, along with some other friends that show up for various pizza and movie nights and so on and so forth, uh, until a school system decides or other professionals decide they're going to take the child away because this person can't be a parent. Um, and then ultimately they decide that he's, his parenting has been very effective and so uh, she's returned to the house household. So in a sense it was really kind of an interesting, it was an uplifting movie. Um, it still has that childlike innocence and you know some stereotypical stuff, but it there's a great example of the power that things like this that maybe some of us in the business would kind of eh, it's not perfect, we'd wish it'd be a little bit better, but still I'll tell you a story about I am Sam. The state of Idaho. Does anybody think of the state of Idaho as a leader in all things? Does anybody think about a leader, a social leader in anything? Well, I have, a, I, have a, I, have a, I have a story for you. Idaho was one of the first states in the union to pass a law that protected the rights of parents with a disability. Parents with any disability. So that any child custody dispute in the courts over divorce, any childbirth issue, Anything related to children and custody of children had to determine the quality of parenting, not the presence or lack of a disability. And that doesn't happen in very many states. It was a landmark uh, uh, passage. We had to play with it a little bit. Uh, initially, they didn't want to include people with a mental illness. And so it was two years later that we got that included. But. Anybody that's familiar with processes of state government, and it's the same whether you're in Idaho or whether you're in Washington, is a bill will get written, um, hopefully, if you can find a sponsor. Then hopefully you can find co-sponsors. 
Hopefully you can get co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle and maybe even throw in an independent if you can. Um, so the more co-sponsors you have, the better it looks. But ultimately, any time you have that bill, you have to pick, or sometimes it's picked for you, a committee that that bill goes to. So what's it most going to impact? Well, in this case, a change in child custody laws and disability stuff went to the Health and Welfare Committee in Idaho. Now, everybody, we live in a democracy, right? Group makes a decision? Wrong. One person can drive legislation. The chairperson of a committee can choose to have a bill looked at, or he can open his, or she can open their drawer and shove it in there, and it's gone. It will not get debated on the floor. It will not see the light of day for that session, until, unless you can find another committee that can take it up and override it. Well, in this case, this bill came to the Health and Welfare Committee, and debate was raging. Oh my God, you know, what if a person in a wheelchair, what if somebody runs a way and they go going downstairs and the person can't follow them? What if a person's blind and they don't know what their child's doing? What if, what if, what if? Oh my God, our world's full of what ifs. The sky is falling. Gee, we never hear that, do we? Um, certainly not. No, these days, nobody would foment fear. Um, anyway, sorry, I lapse into things now and again, don't I? It's terrible. Shame on me. Um, so everybody was talking about this. Well, it just so happened that the chair of that committee had gone and seen I Am Sam. And he told the other chair, the people in the committee, he said, I want you to come see a movie with me. And they went out, and a number of them showed up, and they went to see I Am Sam. The next day, they unanimously passed that legislation. And it went to the floor. It passed. It was one of the leading things. Uh, you'll see stuff about Idaho quoted in a, there's an outfit called Through the Looking Glass on Parenting with a Disability. And Idaho was one of their, their leaders in that. And I'm really proud of that. A good friend of mine who's director of the uh, National Council on Independent Living now, Kelly Buckland, uh, a chair user who has a son who's now flying. Um, the, uh, we were leaders in that, and that was really cool. And so that's the power that media can have. So even when it's not quite perfect, it can still shape something. And so as we look at things and we kind of become overly crit critical, we kind of have to be aware also that, wait, is there another message there? And I bring that full circle back around to my terminology thing because I've really softened on terminology now. And I encourage other folks around me because take a look at what's happening before you chastise somebody on the language they use because it may be that they're your, they're your best friend. And uh, so let's see if we can tweak things rather than lambaste somebody with stuff. So we had this uh, dread talked about uh, too uh, earlier. Uh, Glee, the character in Glee. Um, most folks are not played by disabled actors. Imagine that. Um, and so what is often some kind of a, a positive portrayal for the most part, other than the dancing scene, um, dreaming of not being in a chair, which again, you know, I mean, there's always those times, every one of us, I mean, I dream I could throw a football like Joe Montana or something, but never happened. And I've not yet been able to dunk a basketball. So things are changing. And this is the kind of the, the pleasurable trends. We're starting to see some cool stuff. Here's a 19-year-old uh, deaf Asian transgender actor, Chella Man. And he will play the mute bisexual hero, Jericho, in the DC Universe series, Titans. So that's kind of cool. At least they're using it now. You can say things about the superheroes and the powers and all that stuff. But regardless, they're using an actor with a disability. Anybody watch Game of Thrones? I hear it's the last season of Game of Thrones, right? And this is uh, Tyrion, Tyrion Lannister, played by um, um, uh, Peter Dinklage, who's been in, you know, 4,000 movies as the dwarf. Um, because that's what they have, right? I mean, little people. Uh, we go way back to the uh, uh, Wizard of Oz. 
and all of the, you know, we are the lollipop guild and so on and so forth. And so they got midgets for that and little people that did not have dwarfism. And uh, so they actually got jobs, but it was definitely a stereotypical portrayal. This is kind of a cool one because even though the storyline talks about, you know, the discrimination and so on he faced even with his own family, the character itself is a powerful character, right? And it doesn't really focus, the character does not focus on his dwarfism or his small stature. It focuses on lots of other stuff. And it's, uh, I've never watched it, so I've just, as I was looking at things, it kind of piques my curiosity, but I've been told that one shouldn't watch just one. So you end up binge watching. The average American sees about 5,000 advertisements in the media per day. And of course, when you start, yeah, and start throwing in things on the phone and so on, there's a tremendous amount of advertising out there. People with disabilities make up about, and their family members, and so on, 25% of Americans. So do we see one quarter of the people in ads, persons with a disability? No. However, we are starting to see more, and I think that's the, uh, that's the positive side. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting, we have a program called Blue Path, and if you look at it, blue-path.org, it's a website that looks at things based on the Americans with Disabilities Act, looks at accessibility of businesses, and you'll see that most Pullman businesses are actually on there thanks to Washington State University students and some community activity things that they did. Um, and um, that looks at creating a listing for people with a disability and their friends and their family members of places and what kind of access they have. So you know when, you go, when you're going out to a restaurant, is there a bathroom I can use? Um, is the lighting good enough that I can read a menu? Do they have large print menus? Do they, are they really noisy with lots of echoes? Is it hard to hear? And things like that. So we hope it's going to be really helpful for people with a disability. The flip side of that is it markets businesses. And a lot of businesses, they look at us and say, well, market. Well, no, it's, you know, because how do we look at disability issues? What, is, is, is it business or is it charity? Charity, most often, right? Don't we think about disability and things like that as charitable kind of things? How many billions of dollars do you think the disability market is worth per year? Anybody a guess? How about millions of dollars? How about $220 billion a year? Which is about twice the teen market. So what we also tell businesses is, yeah, this is a charitable thing to do. I guess you could say that. It's giving people some information they really need. It's the trip advisor and so on, we hope, eventually, of travel and visiting stores and programs for people with a disability. It's that information that nobody else has and so on. But by putting your businesses on here, you're going to market to over $200 billion in market per year. So it's powerful stuff. We have a negotiating point. Should we start to decide to use it with the media and with the general public? One quarter of us, let's get together. Because we feel like normalizing how people with disability are just part of the community. We're part of the human condition. Because humans, by their nature, are different. And so we should just be a part of that humanity. Representation is important. Um, we see a lot of that value of that positive image that's starting to work. We see same-sex couples with adoption. Oh my god, they all have kids. Now we see it everywhere. It's interesting, that local narrative where we start to see these things change and become so accepted. And you see many, many examples. We're starting to see examples of people with a disability just appearing in a, an ad. So we see advertising where there's a person signing as one of the families. 
Um, some of them you see, you know, we actually did a thing signing, but it was with zombies, and so the fingers fall off. But anyway, um, ads are an effective agent of change. So you have to do it right. If a brand calls out, hey, look at me, I'm using a person with a disability, and that's a central focus, it really doesn't work very well. If it's embedded, if it's a part of things, that works. So forget admiration, inspiration, pity. Remember, people with disabilities are not all super gimps. We're not likely to climb Mount Everest. So the trends, pleasurable trends. I'll wrap up with pleasurable trends. Uh, some companies are really focusing on people with a disability. And they're starting to pay attention to things that we need with technology. Um, it used to be that Windows-based products were kind of the only ones that would be very accessible to people who were blind or visually impaired. You'd have to get external programs like JAWS and other screen reader programs. Apple came out with their new operating system and they started to embed things like voiceover, um, the large you know, magnification and so on. And um, they're carrying that a step further. Here's an ad. People think that having a disability is a barrier. But that's not a way I see it. You can catch up with friends. Ready? You can capture a moment with your family. One face, small face, focus lock. And you can start the day bright and early. You can take a trip to somewhere new. Three miles to the summit. You can concentrate on every word of a story. A bird began to sing. Jack opened his eyes. You can take the long way home. edit a film like this one. When technology is designed for everyone, it lets anyone do what they love, including me. So good job, Apple. Person using a head switch to alter a movie and all the pictures. And one of the things I didn't do is, is because the one thing we don't have is an auditorially described. Some things are still Kitty the not Apple. there. Привет, Apple. Ah, thank you. So that's obviously focused advertising and trying to you know sell more product because they've heard about that two hundred billion dollar market. Smart people at Apple. Um, so, the nicest though is as we see something that's just embedded in a part of things that isn't even mentioned. And so, for the final view, Teacher assigns. Oh, that was a beautiful job. Action. One, five, start. Right. Dad! Homework. Now give it a shot. No homework. Oh my God. High five. You made that. You were last on my list.
Yes, he's wholesome. I simply can't see why you even exist. Yeah, way awesome, eh? They don't even mention. The woman uses a power chair, and it's just about making snacks on honey graham wafers. Great job. And so that's the stuff, we start to see that, then that's just a part of life. And really, isn't that a little bit more reflective of what we see around us most of the time? I think it is, because that's kind of what we kind of feel like more and more at the local level. So that's my quick, uh, quick thing on... Um, Disability in the media kind of covered all sorts of things as it kind of needed to because I wasn't exactly sure what else would be covered. But as uh, I really do encourage everybody to take a look as you see images and so on that are coming from somebody, as you hear language that you think might be a little limiting and it seems like the right thing to do, we should get together and continue to make our voices heard um, because that's limiting somebody. And when the special thing comes up, um, try to figure out a way to see if that special can become kind of not so special or maybe just everybody is kind of part of something. And to their credit, Special Olympics has begun and there will be some uh, a chapter starting here, I believe at, on Washington State uh, or in Pullman. Um, they actually have a program now that tries to pair kind of a 50-50 split of uh, non-disabled and and young people with a disability. So, um, so that's kind of a step. I mean, it's still artificial, but in reality, you know, it's, it's part of it is, is giving an opportunity for folks to get involved, and, and it is an effort to try to balance things. And the reality is, is sometimes, you know, folks, we do hang around with who we feel comfortable with. And so having that opportunity to make the choice is what it really needs to be all about. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Anything? No? Feel welcome to catch me afterwards. Just don't throw things. Feel free to grab some coffee, tea, water while I get the next thing set up. Just a couple of logistics while we're settling down and getting ready for our next, um, for our keynote presentation. Um, if you're here for CFSL credit, um, make sure to swipe in with us and swipe out with the CFSL representative. Um, that'll make sure that you get your program credit um, and that we can count you as having been here. Um, also, if everybody can, um, just put away laptops, cell phones, all of that, so we've got our attention at the front, that would be great.
So I'm going to go ahead and get introductions started for our keynote. I know there's still a couple people swiping in. Take your time. Um, my name is Rochelle Datch. I'm the assistant director at the Access Center. Um, and I'm here to um, introduce our keynote speaker, Owen Kent. Um, Owen is um, a writer, act actor, uh, local advocate in the Bay Area. Um, but more importantly, he's a longtime friend of mine from our days at UC Berkeley. Um, and when a mutual friend of Owen and I's uh, told me about Owen's most recent project, I just, I knew he had to be the keynote for this year's symposium. Um, and this was over a year ago that I heard about this. And um, I hadn't yet asked Owen um, if he was going to do that or had time. Um, but when I did get around to posing it to him, um, he graciously agreed to drive up two days um, from the Bay Area through rain and snow and probably lots and lots of lack of sleep. Um, and he's here with us today. Um, so most of what we have talked about to, at today's symposium have, has revolved around one of many components um, around disability, disability in the media, whether that's around um, issues surrounding disabled actors getting disabled roles, um, or the good, bad, and ugly of the portrayal of disabi disability in the media, or just the overall lack of inclusion of disabled voices in media. Um, and Owen, being the overachiever that he is, uh, kind of took all of that on in one huge project. And he's going to share his, his adventure um, writing, producing, and starring in his own movie. Um, so please join me in welcoming Owen to the stage. All right, all right, well, yeah, thank you so much for having me, and I really, you know, am honored to be here, and all of the, all of the speakers today has been such a, a wonderful experience learning from them and seeing the, the wonderful work that they're doing. So let's give a, let's give a big round of applause to them, too. And none of this would be possible without Michelle and Danica's hard work and everyone else at the Access Center. We've been communicating for, for months and months and it's so wonderful to have such a, such a great turnout and we really, really appreciate you all for coming. So let's give the Access team and yourselves a hand. Great, so um, as I said, my name is Owen Kent. I've been if we can go to the next slide, that'd be great. So just a little bit of background on, on me. So um, I grew up in Colorado in Rocky Mountain National Park, if anyone knows where that is. Um, both of my parents are outdoor enthusiasts and very much athletic people. My dad is a, a mountaineer and my mom has run you know, so many marathons, she was in the Olympics in the, the 80s. And, um, you know, I like to say I got the recessive genes from them. <laughs> but thankfully, because I think if uh, I had not, they would have made me run track or something horrible like that. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so following my, my time in Colorado, I graduated high school uh, like a year early because I wasn't, wasn't too happy and I moved out to California to study at UC Berkeley, which is where I met Michelle. And during that time, I originally was going to be studying mathematics. Uh, I got a lot, of, a lot of satisfaction from just, you know, knowing that there was a right answer to something. But the, the more I, you know, studied and uh, spent a lot of time isolated with, uh, with my math textbook, I decided that that was maybe not what I wanted to spend my time in college doing. So I took some time off and did some traveling. I actually went to, to Egypt. So there's a picture of me 
in the south of Egypt, um, and that was a really, really powerful experience that that shaped um, it shaped a lot about how I view disability, and it gave me a uh, awareness to the you know the state of affairs in the United States um, for disability, just because in so many parts of the world, disability is you know, an incredibly different matter of life. Um, you know, there were, there were a lot of experiences that I had there that were just really, really moving. Just, you know, people that do not have literally anything. And, uh, you know, there are no supports. There are no really universities that are designed to enable and promote people with disabilities especially. Um, so that, that was a really, a really powerful experience. Um, so upon returning to, to Berkeley, I decided to, you know, re, reinvent myself. That's kind of what you do in California. <laughs> and um, I went into to film. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so why, why storytelling? Um, I think that, you know, humans are inherently social creatures, and I think it's just, you know, from the days of gathering around a fire to, you know, talk about hunting a roaring mammoth or whatever, we just tell stories, and that's our, our way of, of interacting with each other. And through that interaction, I think that we are able to, to learn a lot about each other, and, you know, maybe not in a, a strictly, you know, educational setting, like a lecture or a, a classroom, but something much more organic and, and um, you know, and fun, too. You know, stories are fun, they are entertaining, and that is something that I wanted to use um, to, you know, in a way, advocate for people with disabilities. Um, you know, I feel, well, I've been very fortunate um, personally, and you know, as you'll see through this, through this, uh, this speech, a lot of this is just about me, which is great, because that's my favorite topic, so <laughs> no problem there. Um, so, you know, keep in mind that to what I'm saying, this is very much my personal experience, and that doesn't necessarily represent other people with disabilities or even other people. Um, so, you know, this is very much my experience. Um, so, with that in mind, I, I went and applied to the, the Film and Media Studies at UC Berkeley. Um, the Film and Media Studies is a, a branch of the rhetoric department. So it's kind of like, uh, I mean, I assume you know what, what rhetoric is, but a lot of like arguments, basically. And I really, really learned a lot about that. I was hoping for a bit more of hands-on practicality of filmmaking, um, but, you know, that was okay because I just did that extra, extra curriculary. Um, so let's go to the next slide here. So as I, as I was saying about my time, um, you know, thinking about, about disability in a historical context, um, a lot has changed. You know, we can think about the disability rights uh, movement in the, the 60s and 70s when people largely in San Francisco were fighting for physical access to governmental buildings. So there was something called the 504 protests, which was in San Francisco. It was a sit-in of a federal building, which is actually the longest occupation of a federal building, I think, to this date. Um, and at that time, 
there were no ramps to get into this to this building because that was not part of the law. So you can imagine, you know, coming back from Vietnam having fought for your country and you need to get a new driver's license, you actually have to get out of your wheelchair and physically crawl your way up to fill out a, a form. So it was really, you know, really dehumanizing and really a problem, but people took it upon themselves to, to change this. And, you know, because of that and other efforts around the country, the ADA was passed in 1990, which mandates accessibility. So that really was a big step in, you know, physical access as well as, you know, other, other ways of access too. That's not to say that that is perfect or that we're done fighting for access because we're not. There's still a lot of, a lot of problems, but when, you know, when dissecting the, the problems associated with the societal implications of disability, I often like to remember that we have accomplished a lot, and I think it's important to not take that for granted. So in the media particularly, you know, a lot of values have changed. This is a poster from, I think, 1933. The movie was called Freaks, and it is about a, a sideshow on a circus, and all of the people on the sideshow had disabilities because in you know, the bygone era, circuses were a big employer for people with disabilities because that was how society was set up. Um, it's a fascinating film and it is very, uh, very offensive to be, <laughs> to be quite frank, um, but it's worth a, worth a watch. One other note that I hadn't, hadn't heard brought up today, the, the slogan of this conference, nothing about us without us. Um, you know, for those of you that may have studied disabilities or have friends or family with disabilities, that's a saying that, you know, it, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it means that in the advocacy, process and and beyond you don't want to legislate change or recommend change without actually talking to people with disabilities um i think that happens quite frequently is that you know people's voices are, are minimized or discounted um and that's not necessarily the best thing so i think that in the media especially it's important that we exercise that notion and exercise nothing about us without us and we don't allow the media machine to produce content that is not in some way including or representing people with, with disabilities. Next slide, please. And at the end, we're going to have some, some time for Q&A, so save your questions for later. Um, so while I was studying screenwriting at Berkeley, um, I was kind of put in a somewhat awkward position because I had these ambitions to, to actually write a film that would be produced and something that I thought would be, uh, you know, commercially viable. Um, so while studying, you know, in this one book in particular from uh, Sid Field, who's, I believe he's the chair of the UCLA Film Department, or used to be. Um, this is in, in reference to uh, character development and one thing that you learn in film school is that film is 
a visual medium of communication. So you want to communicate to your audience um, through visual information as much as possible. So you know, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have your characters say anything. You would be able to know what they're thinking and know what they're feeling just from their, their representation, which is a double-edged sword because on one hand, that has a lot of power to bring people's perceptions to new places, but there's also a negative side to it where Sid Field says that you can basically just, you know, have someone ramp and that is a representation that they're somehow emotionally crippled. So, you know, I don't want to say too much bad about Sid Field because I learned a lot about sweet writing from him, but I definitely disagree with this. And I feel like that this, you know, visual rhetoric is a big, a big hindrance to representation, especially because this is a, a book that screenwriters are given in their, their early years of training, and that kind of precipitates a, a foundation of ableism in their work. So I think the, the problem with Hollywood goes really deep, and yeah, don't, don't get me started on, on Hollywood, but it's a terrible place. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So one thing that I thought we could talk about that is a really interesting, interesting topic is the hero's journey. Um, does anyone know the work of Joseph Campbell? You can just raise your hand. Okay, a few of you, all right. Um, so Joseph Campbell is a mythologist and he read some really foundational work for storytelling um, in, the, in the 20th century. It was a long time ago. And um, let's go to the next slide. So basically, the hero's journey is a framework for mythology that is really pervasive through a lot of different stories. The most known example is Star Wars. So if you follow around this chart, you can kind of see the, the different, different plot points that the hero journeys through along his path. So the first is the call to adventure and the refusal to adventure. So if you think about it in terms of uh, Star Wars, when Luke Skywalker finds Obi-Wan Kenobi, he's like, you're a Jedi. You have to fight the Empire. He's like, eh, not for me. But then his family gets murdered, and he's like, oh, all right, I guess I won't do that. Um, the reason why I bring this up is because in the, the helper stage, um, basically, that's when the hero finds uh, different companions to assist him or her on their journey. So again, in Star Wars, that might be the example of, you know, Luke finding Han Solo or Chewbacca, and they basically assist him in his, his adventure. Um, I think a lot of times in the media, people with disabilities fall into that helper category. Um, a great example brought up by the previous speaker was from Game of Thrones. The, um, uh, I think it's Jamie Lannister. He's, a, he's an assistant, basically. He's not one of the main characters, but he is a, an important character. Um, and I think he's a, he's a really great representation of disability because while it informs its, his character, that's not the, the overwhelming aspect. So through my work, I aimed to bring the helper into 
the main character, so instead of having a person with a disability as a, you know, a minor character, I wanted them to be a major character. Um, other things that I think are really important about the, the hero's journey is that, well, it's about hero's journey, but also mythology in general, um, is that in myth, you're able to identify the societal values by providing a counterpoint to it. So basically, you know, you are able to, to distinguish good from bad, you know, good from evil, etc., etc., by showing someone like Darth Vader, for example, you know, like, why is he evil? It's because our cultural values inform it as such, you know, I mean, if we were in a, a dictatorship or an empire, we might feel very differently about Darth Vader and his, his work, but we don't, and we found that out through storytelling. So, that's often called the dragon of the culture, so, you know, in fairy tales, the hero often faces the dragon, and in my film, Angels of Mercy, which is what we're going to be talking about next, I address a, um, <laughs> a dragon of my culture, or disability culture, which is the medical profession. And one thing that I, you know, I think is, is a challenge when you're talking about the disability community is that it's so broad and so diffuse. You know, my disability is very different than someone with autism, for example. You know, we both have disabilities, but they're completely different. So when you say disability culture, you, I think it's good to specify a bit more of what you mean. So, yeah, let's do the next slide. So, the journey begins. So my story with Angels of Mercy began about three years ago. I, you know, have always been interested in filmmaking and, you know, just creative endeavors in general. Uh, making a feature film is probably one of the hardest things that can be done, it feels like. I don't know if you've ever had to make a short film for a cross project or something, but imagine trying to do that for like 90 minutes and have it actually make sense. <laughs> It's quite the, quite the endeavor. So here's a picture of me, our director of photography, and in the back is my co-star, kind of working behind us. And on my chair is a Aria Alexa Mini, which is a cinema grade camera. It's what they shot Blade Runner 2049 on. Um, our director of photography works at a a pretty big startup in San Francisco, and they just happen to have one of those cameras that they don't use on the weekend. So we, uh, we, we borrowed it and had quite a bit of fun with it. So, Angels of Mercy is the, the name of my film. A little bit later on, we're going to see the trailer for it. Um, it started out as a screenplay that I co-wrote with my collaborator, Andrew Barkoff. He directed the film, and I star in the film. Uh, my character's name is Zach, and Zach is a computer security specialist who has, for reasons that become evident throughout the film, he's isolated himself in the wilderness and has kind of uh, 
living into some, some like paranoias and some fears. So the movie is a home invasion thriller. So it's a, it's a horror movie. So I know, any horror fans in the audience? All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of people ask me why I chose horror. And that's a great question because it ties into the, to the mythology bit and the fact that you're able to really mess with people's perceptions through something that's um, really, uh, really powerful. I like to say that in horror films, no one is safe. And through that, you're able to, to really you know, change, change perceptions. Um, so we wrote the screenplay. That took about a year. And then we went into production down in Los Angeles. So let's go to the next slide. So we wanted to design a set that incorporated aspects of the universal design in architecture. Um, so if anyone here is a you know, civil engineer or architect, then you know, universal design is basically designing a building and so that it's effective and usable for anyone. Um, surprisingly, we were unable to find that structure in the real world, so we resorted to building it um, on our own. So basically, what you're looking at here is our, our Zaffer. And for those of you that don't know, Zaffer is basically the lead electrician on a film set. And he's using these different LED panels that we made to light the, the skeleton of the, the building that the film takes place in. The whole movie takes place over one night. So we did that to, to save money in production. And it also takes place in one location, again, for, you know, budgetary reasons. Um, yeah. So this is in my dad's friend's driveway. <laughs> And we were planning on leaving it there for two months. And that lasted about a day. And his dad was like, uh-uh, not going to work. It, actually, you know what? It wasn't his dad. It was the neighbors. The neighbors were super pissed. <laughs> <laughs> they thought people were like, moving in. Um, all right, so next slide. So we decided to rent a warehouse. So we went to uh, Swanson Avenue in downtown LA. And uh, yeah, that's a pretty interesting area of Los Angeles. And so we rented this warehouse and this is where we made the majority of the film. So this is what it looked like when we got it. And then next slide, this is us building it. You can see Andrew there on the right, a lot of friends. Um, on the back left, that's uh, another, another room that is in the, in the movie. All right, next slide. So it's coming together. Next slide. And there you go, it's like almost done there, not quite. All right, next slide. And then we tore it down. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was quite the emotional experience after I literally blood and sweat and tears. There were some fights on set. And then we just tore it down. And uh, I wanted to run a, a, a car into it to tear it down, but that didn't, that didn't go over too well. Um, yeah, let's do the next slide. This is uh, my co-star, Amber Gaston. She plays my caregiver in the film. Um, you know, something that I wanted to do is, 
explore the, the relationship dynamic between, you know, someone with a disability and their caregiver. Um, that's something that I feel like has not really been done, done justice to in a lot of movies like, you know, Me Before You or The Upside, what have you. And it's a really interesting, interesting dynamic just because it's like, you know, you get to know each other really well. Um, and so there's a lot of, a lot of interesting stuff that happens there. Um, next slide, please. And here we have um, another actor. He's a great actor. He's been on a lot of MTV shows, uh, Dylan McKee. And he is a non-disabled actor that plays someone with cerebral palsy. Um, and, you know, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but he dies in the movie. And the reason why uh, we decided to to kill him is a, <laughs> it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a symbolic gesture that by killing off the, the person that, you know, is an able-bodied person playing someone with a disability, we're kind of killing off that, that trend. Um, so that was an intentional choice. Um, Next slide. So one thing that I learned through, through the movie, and this is something that my dad told me, is that hardship is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Um, so, you know, what that means to me is that, you know, life is not easy, <laughs> I don't think, for anyone. Um, so you can just accept that and move on and just try to deal with it. Or you can, you know, just like suffer through it and try to, you know, get out of it. But um, that definitely, I thought about that quite a bit as we were, we were filming and literally everything went wrong that you can imagine. Um, just last week, we're like almost done with the final edit of the movie, and the uh, hard drive broke, so have to <laughs> re-edit the movie now, but it's way better this time, so don't worry. <laughs> and, um, yeah, this is a, uh, this is like part of the set in the movie, so my character has a uh, hacker space where he works on electronics, so we call it the hat pad, and uh, yeah, it's like a shot of that. One other, uh, you know, hardship thing is that we had to rent a Airbnb for like a month in LA while we were filming the movie, um, and we were like, yeah, they have a, you know, accessible bathroom, right? So, oh yeah, absolutely, totally accessible. And they didn't. So <laughs> when we were there, <coughs> um, the uh, the shower had like a three-inch rip into it, and I use a, a rolling shower chair to get in. And so every day you had to like do a little really to get over this thing. And one day before filming, the really went too far. I uh, fell over backwards, and it was like uh, terrifying, but it worked out because we were filming a horror movie, so. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, let's go to the next slide. So basically, I was like, all right, it's over, we're like, done filming, but we had to get a few more exterior shots. So this is on the very final day of filming, we found a great, <laughs> a great location in San Cruz, and we get there, we're super excited, and there's a giant, giant mud puddle in our way. And we're like, oh man, what are we gonna do? We were like, we had to do it this day, because this is like the last day that we had access to the camera, 
So we literally had to finish the entire movie on this day, like during the daylight. And so what do you do in this situation? Oh, you can go to the next slide. You just go through the forest. <laughs> and uh, we made it. So that's where we filmed on the right side, which is kind of cool. And that's Andrew. He's helping me get through the, the forest. And you know, I had so much tree in my wheelchair that day. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the, you know, a little bit of the, the background. Um, so yeah, let's do the next slide. So one of the main, main takeaways uh, from my film that I wanted to, to impart with you guys is, um, so this scene is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Um, so here is my character, Zach, <laughs> talking to his doctor, and his doctor is basically um, trying to convince him to take a, uh, a cure for his disease. Um, a few people have talked about this today and what it means to, you know, to be presented with a, you know, a quote-unquote cure for your disease. Um, in my case, I have a type of muscular dystrophy so I was sometimes born with. And, you know, throughout my life, <coughs> there's never been a, uh, a treatment or anything. Um, but recently, there has been a treatment approved by the FDA, which is super exciting. And, you know, but it, it really got me thinking, you know, the fact that I do identify as having a disability. Like, what does it mean that there's now, you know, something that wouldn't necessarily cure my disability, but it would change my identity. And I think that, you know, don't get me wrong, that I think that, um, <laughs> I'm not saying that, like, you know, medical treatments are bad, or, you know, I'm not an anti-vaccine person, but I am, you know, I am cognizant of the fact that when you are presenting a, you know, a treatment or a cure for something that's so ingrained in someone's identity, there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of emotions that come up around that and a lot of conflict. So I, you know, I took that and incorporated it into the screenplay. Um, so, you know, he says, I don't want this cure. I want people to stop thinking I need one, um, and I think that it's pretty self-explanatory that, you know, Zach doesn't view himself as, you know, inferior or what have you to anyone else in society. It's really society's values that need to change in order to normalize disability. Um, so in, in the framework of the hero's journey, this would be the, the facing of the dragon. And the real central question as to you know, what drives these characters. Um, so with that, we can watch the, uh, the trailer and then you know, I'll say a few, few more things. Yeah. That's weird. Hmm. What is it? Yeah, I'm sorry. Hitler's toothpick. <laughs> well, uh, tonight's my night off, so I called Phil.
Tchau. creating a better world. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's the trailer for Angels of Mercy, so get stoked. It's gonna be pretty sweet. <laughs> um, yeah, so a few, a few, like, you know, closing, closing thoughts, and then I'll open up these questions, is that, you know, what I, what I did and what I'm trying to do is really be an active participant in the media and not let representation pass me by, so to say. Um, you know, I really am a pretty particular person, and I think a lot of people with disabilities are, so... Yeah, you know, I was in a position to to be able to do this, and I I did. You know, we're not we're not done yet. There's still a long ways to go, but we're submitting to to film festivals this year. We hope to get into Sundance um, for you know 2020, and um, yeah, you know, I just really want to you know extend some some gratitude to everyone that has helped us you know, throughout, throughout this whole process. Um, you know, as far as I know, yeah, well, actually there were a few people with disabilities that, that helped us out on set, but um, most of the, the crew um, were able-bodied people, and, you know, I really want that to be, to be noted that, you know, it, it does take a real community to be able to empower people with disabilities in an effective way. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think that it's something where you can be real isolationist about it and say, you know, only people with disabilities can do such and such, and that's the only accurate thing. I think it really comes back to nothing about us without us and that we need to be, you know, in a, a very sensually included in whatever process that might be. In my case, it's filmmaking, um, but that could be anything. It could be architecture, you know, legislation, law, whatever you might have. Um, it's just being a, an active participant. Um, so, you know, where do we go from here? I feel like I really want to encourage, you know, any and all of you that have an interest in in disability, and I assume that you do because you're here. The really, you know, don't be afraid to, to ask challenging questions or do challenging things or create challenging artwork, and especially artwork that challenges. And just really, yeah, don't, don't hold back. And, you know, you can be afraid about like language and worrying about upsetting people, but I feel like that a lot of, you know, a lot of really great conversations and learning moments have come from, uh, come from challenging perceptions. So um, I really just want to say thank you to WSU for putting on this event. It's been a really, really informative. I've learned a lot personally, and I think it's a, a great endeavor that I hope continues. So thank you. Uh, yeah, if, if feel free to ask any questions. I'm sure there's at least, at least one question. <laughs>
we can talk about how your body's arm. Um, so this uh, this I got for the movie actually. Um, it's a it's a piece of assistive technology made by a company in uh, Canada called Canova, um, and it's really really quite cutting edge. Um, I I reached out to the company that makes it a uh, couple years ago because I thought it was really important that my character in the movie have it um, since he's a, a hacker and a, you know, a maker um, he would definitely have something like this and I was like hey do you want to you want to give me one uh, <laughs> and they're like no can't do that because they're like exorbitantly expensive as you can imagine but they did let me borrow one for a few months and um, <laughs> yeah and then one of their their other users actually passed away and their family had seen my some of my work and they wanted to uh, to donate it to me so this one is actually mine to keep which is great <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm really into assistive technology too. Um, I think that that really empowers people with disabilities. Um, you know, a lot of those speakers today have talked about, you know, like the representation, the <laughs> symbolic representation of a wheelchair, and that it's actually something that empowers rather than inhibits. So for people with disabilities, you know, a, a wheelchair isn't a bad thing, it's actually a good thing because it allows them to, to be active in the world. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, I think, do you have a microphone or something? <laughs> okay. Um, are you going to make any more movies? Yeah, maybe not for a while, though. Yeah, yeah, this is really, really taking it out of me. Um, but no, absolutely. I, I have a few other, a few other feature scripts that I've been working on. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that this movie does well on the festival circuit, and then for the next movie we can have a bigger budget and more explosions. So. <laughs> So yes, I definitely, definitely do. Yeah. Okay, hi, I loved your trailer by the way. I think what you're doing is really amazing. But um, I know you talked about like normalizing disabilities and I just wondered like what that meant to you or like what people can do better in terms of like normalizing disabilities. Yeah, well thank you. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. And I wish I had a simple answer. But I don't. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of what makes disability challenging is that there's so many different types of disability, and you know, each type of disability has different personalities. So what may be, you know, affirming and helpful to one person may not be to another person. Um, so the best advice I can give is just to you know, be like an empathetic human being and just, you know, try to try to imagine like what that person may or may not be going through and then just, you know, try to, you know, navigate your behavior around that. I don't think that there's a, you know, one size fits all. I mean, one thing, for example, is like, you know, when people see me at like an elevator or something, you know, sometimes they, they offer, like, oh, hey, do you want some help pushing that button? 
And usually I do. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's like a friendly gesture. Um, you know, so that's something to me personally that I appreciate. Um, you know, that said, I think that another person might be offended or whatever, be like, oh yeah, I can do it myself. But, you know, I don't think that's a, that's a reason to not do it. I think just kind of being a, a genuine person, just saying like, hey, you know, do you, do you want any help? Or just trying to think about what they might be going through. Um, so that's, that's half an answer. But, um, you know, in terms of, I guess like on a bigger scale, normalizing disability, I think that events like this, you know, disability awareness symposium is really important because, you know, we are simply making people aware of disability and aware of some of the, you know, the, the highs and the lows of disability and really, you know, giving people a, an awareness that this is a, a, a life experience that a lot of people go through. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Um, <laughs> and I got my, my info on here, if you want to connect on the internet. Um, and also, uh, Angels of Mercy has a Facebook page and Instagram and stuff. So just search for that, Angels of Mercy film. And yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.